The thing about Marshall, though, is character. You know, character matters, and if you have to say anything about the book, it's just, you you say, what is it about? It's character. Everybody knew he lived by a moral code that was (laughs) above most others, and they did not want to, you know, they did not want to displease him in any way. Um, You know, he's called the man with a plan, but he did so much more. Uh, So I I had this great reverence for the way he conducted himself and the strong character he had because he could have been he could have been president he could have been anything are we ever going to get back to the point where we have these kinds of people in our government um you know are we ever going to get back to the era where we have moral people that will take stands on principle that's my dad dave roll this week on the rich roll podcast Rich Roll Podcast. Okay, so this one, for reasons both obvious and perhaps less so, is pretty special. Uh, It's a little unique. And I think there's something about the structure, the formality of sitting in front of a microphone that that allows – that permits a certain kind of conversation, an intimate experience – uh, that really just generally doesn't happen otherwise. There's this ceremonial kind of aspect of it, the inherent decorum that creates a kind of undefinable window to go places with people that you otherwise perhaps just wouldn't. And from the very beginning of this podcast journey, I, I've wanted to have my dad on the show, uh, to have a reason to sit down uninterrupted and ask him all kinds of questions about his life, uh, things I've always wanted to know about him. But for whatever reason, I just, I never asked. And maybe it just was never the right time or the setting wasn't correct. And I think I had on some level this this fear that if I didn't make it a priority, that it might never happen. And, uh, and that's something that I know for sure that I would regret. Uh, and to be honest, I didn't do it earlier only because I was super busy. On some level, I think... I just thought it wouldn't work for the show, but nonetheless, that at some point I would do it anyway and perhaps just not share it just so that we could have that moment and I could keep it, you know, for posterity and and, and for my kids. But a pretty compelling reason arose to turn this rumination and, and procrastination on this thing into a reality. And that reason is that my dad, who has always been this avid, fanatical student of history. I mean, this is a guy who on countless weekends would pile my sister and me into the station wagon to go visit some, you know, Civil War battlefield. Uh, He's gone on to write this incredible new book. It's called George Marshall, Defender of the Republic. And it's this amazing, compelling chronicle of the life of General Marshall, who was America's most distinguished soldier statement, uh, arguably since George Washington. So it's a historical biography, but it's also this very timely, uh, prescient at times meditation, meditation on selflessness, on leadership, on moral character, and how this man's embodiment of these traits, uh, you know, traits that I would contend are quite lacking in our current political climate influenced not just the course of two world wars, but but really and truly helped define the American century. But anyway, by way of background, my dad's a guy who has enjoyed a very successful 35 plus year career as an accomplished attorney, uh, mostly in the field of antitrust. Over the years, he successfully defended clients in investigations and enforcement actions brought by the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And after government service at the FTC, he was a partner and then managing partner uh, of his law firm, this prestigious Washington, D.C. law firm called Stepdown and Johnson. Uh, And then later in his career, he went into public service. He founded the Lex Mundi Pro Bono Foundation, which is this nonprofit that sources legal services for social entrepreneurs around the world. 
And now he's enjoying this incredible third act as, uh, as an author. Uh, Marshall is his third book. His previous titles were also historical biographies. Uh, he wrote a book called The Hopkins Touch, which was all about this guy called Harry Hopkins, who was the most powerful man in FDR's administration. Uh, and then he wrote Lewis Johnson and The Arming of America, his first book, uh, which was about this guy, Lewis Johnson, who was an important figure uh, under Truman and Roosevelt. But with this Marshall book, he's really, I think, positioned, poised to join the ranks of the great historical biographers like Robert Caro and Walter Isaacson, uh, who incidentally actually gave him an amazing blurb for the book. I mean, my dad also got blurbs from General Stanley McChrystal, uh, General Petraeus, William Hitchcock. It's insane. Anyway, the book comes out July 9. It's uh, available for pre-order now on Amazon. I'll put a link up in the show notes on my website. He's got all this national press lined up. And I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm getting emotional, but like, I'm super proud of him. And it's all coming up in a couple few. But first, you know what I want to do? I want to share a listener email with you guys. Okay, so this is from Charles and Greta. Hello, Mr. Roll. I'd like to begin by saying your journey has inspired me in many ways. So for that, I'm grateful for your courage and discipline to get through your struggles. A little over two years ago, I met my girlfriend, Greta, who had been a vegan for six years. I hadn't known much information about what vegan was, and I was naturally curious about what living a vegan lifestyle meant. I began doing my research. And like many, I couldn't deny what I learned. Shortly after, I began my transition and have made one of the best decisions of my life. During this time, I was working as a special needs teacher at a school called Learning Link School in Miami, Florida. I've always loved working with kids, but as somebody who graduated in recreational therapy, my ideal setting was outdoors and wasn't in the classroom, and I felt like I needed to make a change. I struggled with this for years until... One day during lunchtime, I noticed one of my students eating donuts and a large chocolate milk for lunch. I was outraged and went straight to my director who later spoke to the parents. To be honest, this student's lunch barely improved and even worse, he wasn't the only one. I had the idea of starting a lunch program where I could cook healthier meals for our students. I hadn't met Greta yet and doing this alone while having a full-time job was not working out. Fast forward, I meet Greta, and we decide to start a plant-based lunch program called Everyday Foodies at our school in August of 2018. During this time, I continue to work at the school full-time. Greta has her own job, and we run our business. We cook, we package all the food ourselves after our jobs. And to our amazement, it was an incredible success. Kids that hadn't even tried a vegetable are now eating broccoli. We even had a young girl that was on a 100% puree diet and is now chewing and eating solid foods. We now decided to go all in with our program and dedicate ourselves full time and expand to as many schools as possible. We wanna reach as many families as we can and educate them on the benefits of a plant-based lifestyle. So anyway, what an incredible letter. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, this truly is the why behind what I do. To see that this message that I'm propagating and putting out in the world is helping to inspire and connect with people who then go out and actually make tangible, amazing changes with ripple effects that impact many, many people. It's just, it's beautiful. I don't take this stuff for granted at all. And uh, I just, I love sharing letters like that. So thank you for indulging me. In speaking of getting and staying on the right nutritional path, today's episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's summertime, people. What does that mean? It means many of you guys are going to be traveling to new places, eating new foods, getting out of your routine. A lot of you might have races or big events coming up that you're preparing for. So it's critical to get the proper nutrition and immune support that you need to perform your best. And Athletic Greens is here to help. As many of you guys know, I've been traveling a ton. I've been training rather intensely these past couple of weeks. And I really couldn't have made it with Athletic Greens, especially on the road. So for those of you who are plant-based or have other dietary requirements, you know it can be difficult to find the proper fuel in places like airports or unfamiliar ports of call. And Athletic Greens has been 
on a personal level, a total lifesaver for me. Their travel pouches are easy to throw in a suitcase or in my backpack or to take with me on a long run or a bike ride. Not to mention that the packaging is beautiful. And even the unboxing experience with Athletic Greens has turned into a sort of ritual for me, knowing that I'm taking care of my whole body health every time I take this product. So even if you're looking for one of the best, most complete formulas out there, you got to check out Athletic Greens. Their all-in-one superfood supplement has 75 whole food sourced ingredients designed to support your body's nutrition needs across five critical areas of health, including energy, immunity, gut health, hormonal support, and healthy aging. Ingredients are carefully selected at their highest quality, covering multiple supplement categories from essential vitamins and minerals to digestive enzymes and probiotics. Simply put, Athletic Greens is the ultimate nutritional insurance. All this, and they maintain a zero compromise approach in the formulation. Everything's plant-based. It's sourced from whole foods at the highest quality, which means it's gluten-free, it's dairy-free, it's paleo, it's keto, and vegan-friendly. Have I wooed you enough? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to head over to athleticgreens.com forward slash rich roll. And there you, my friends, will receive 20 free travel packs valued at $79 with your first purchase. Athletic Greens is available throughout the U.S., Canada, UK, and EU. So if you want to support your whole body health this summer, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash rich roll and claim your special offer today. We're also brought to you today by Fully. For years, my friends, all of us have suffered through the work week with aching backs, sore necks, using our weekends and an occasional after hour as the time to move our bodies and be active. But it doesn't cut it anymore. You deserve to feel good all the time, don't you? And that's why Fully exists. This is the whole raison d'etre behind this company. Fully transforms the way we feel at work with desks, chairs, and other tools to keep our bodies moving and our minds engaged. Their Jarvis desk is 100% adjustable. It's a standing desk in case you didn't get that. So you can switch positions whenever your body tells you to. It's the best reviewed standing desk online. And it's no wonder it's sleek, it's surprisingly affordable, and it will totally change your relationship to work. But that's not all that Fully makes. Fully has a wide variety of active sitting chairs, too, that you could choose from depending upon your style, whether you're a fidgeter or a traditionalist or somebody who's looking for a simple supported standing position. Fully has you covered. They even have other tools like a standing mat that was inspired by walking barefoot in a forest and monitor arms that raise your computer screen to a position that puts you in an upright, healthy alignment. I love everything they make. I have a bunch of their chairs. It's what I put in my podcast studio. It's what my guests sit on. It's what I'm sitting on right now. And fully has everything you need to create an active office so you can feel and perform at your best. It's time to reimagine what work can feel like. Go to fully.com slash rich roll today. That's F-U-L-L-Y dot com slash rich roll with desk, chairs, and other tools to get us moving. Fully helps you bring your full active self to work. Okay, dad, Dave, David Lee Roll. It's my dad. He's on the podcast. So, you know, we've gone through it over the years. What can I tell you? I've definitely put him through a lot. I think it's fair to say, I think you would agree that he's put me through a little bit here and there as well. And there's been moments, extended periods of not really estrangement. That's too strong a word. Let's just say detachment or disassociation, the strained years. But I got to say that we're in a really good place right now. Uh, we've grown quite close over the last several years uh, and that's good. It feels good. It's a, it's it's really nice to feel like I'm in an intimate, healthy relationship with my dad right now. And so I think the timing for this, for him to join me on this thing that I do here, uh, is, is rather perfect. So this conversation is a balance of many things. Uh, it's a conversation about his life, uh, the history of our relationship, um, which gets a bit emotional. I'm going to get emotional right now talking about it. Uh, and also The Life of Marshall, you know, this book that he's written about this incredible historical figure and, and, and what we can learn from 
this extraordinary man's example, uh, how it relates and informs to how we think about current politics and America uh, and character and uh, and leadership and and morality, really. So I'm excited, a little bit nervous to share this one with you guys, uh, but I think you're going to dig it. In the meantime, please pick up Marshall, Defender of the Republic. You can find it on Amazon or your favorite bookseller. Uh, link in the bio as well. It comes out July 9th, currently on pre-order. And I really think it it's this important and impressive work of epic proportions. Um, Dave is a gentleman. He's a scholar. Uh, and this is our conversation. This is me and my dad. I love you, dad. I'm so proud of you. Welcome to your very first podcast. Thank you. We're rolling. I'm so Thank excited. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is a momentous occasion uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, the first family member that I've had on the podcast. And uh, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. I mean, the occasion is, of course, this remarkable uh, achievement of writing this incredible book, the George Marshall book, Defender of the Republic. That's coming out in July, and we're going to talk about that. I mean, a this big is like plug. Big this is plug. a this is a serious book for serious people. <laughs> you know, it's like six hundred. I mean, the it's like over how how long is this? Six hundred and four pages. Six hundred and four without the notes. I'm intimidated. I've just started know, to read sir. it, um, and it's amazing. It's going to take that. me. It's going to take me a while to get through it. But first of all, congratulations. Thank you. I mean, it's no small thing. And the early feedback on this book has been quite spectacular. You have the Ryan Holiday stamp of approval. He loves it. And you have incredible blurbs from right. like Walter Isaacson and General Stanley McChrystal. It's been quite something, right? Petraeus, didn't Petraeus. you also? Are you, it looks like you're going to do an event with him, perhaps? Petraeus. Yeah, we're doing it in New York in, uh, next fall. Yeah. Wow. Like the 90 yeah, he'll do like an interview thing like you're doing. Right. Like uh, ni I think 92nd Street Y is what No, it's going to be at the New York Historic Society, uh -huh. uh, which is, you know, I don't know, different place. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he likes, he, he wants to do it. So that's got to yeah. be gratifying. So no, I know I didn't ask him. He just sort of said, let's do this. So, right. But you, re how, do you how do you even like reach out to those people? Various ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's quite wily. Um, how you've done that. With Petraeus, I had a friend who, um, you know, your your cousin's uh, uh, roommate at West Point, uh, uh, heard about the book and started. we started corresponding an email. He was head of the army in uh, Europe uh, and just, just, just retired. And he, he contacted Pet Petraeus uh, wow. and Petraeus got in touch with me. Yeah. And said, you know, I'm headed to the Southeast Asia, you know, send me a, a digital copy of the book. So... That's what we did. did. And then here you are. Yeah. So uh, the third book, I feel like this book right. is going to really be the book that's going to break out. Hope so. We'll yeah, see. I think so. Well, we're going to talk about all of that, but I, you know, I, have, I have this opportunity now um, to talk to you about a lot of things yeah. that I've always wanted to talk to you about. Uh -oh. and I think the formality of this kind of allows us to explore that a little bit. Um, you know, like questions that you always have that you just never feel like it's the right time to ask about your life, you know, All right? and how you got to this place. Like, you know, I think um, when I think back to, to my grandparents, like Everett and, and Garnett, like my memory of them as, is as of old, you know, when they were old and I don't feel my like age. I ever really... Yeah, it feels like, yeah. you know, in my memory, of course, is, is you know, far from perfect. So I remember them being quite a bit older. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious about, you know, how you grew up and, and what kind of parents they were and, and kind of what kind of kid you were. You know, when I, think, when I think back, you know, for what it must have been like for you as a young person, I know at one point you mentioned that... Um, there was there was that movie that came out, that Terrence Malick movie that came out called Tree of Life. Yeah, Do you remember that with Brad Pitt. Uh -huh. And it was it was of that era. And I remember you saying to me, like that's that's what it was like when I was a kid. 
when I the remember 50, that in the fifties stuck with yeah. me. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I had a very, you know, uneventful, but very um, pleasant, you know, perfect childhood. Um, and I, I grew up in a um, suburb of Detroit um, called Gross Point. Lived there until I, you know, went away to college. And my parent, my father uh, came off a farm, a farm town in, in uh, middle Illinois, very poor. Um, and I never knew, I never knew his parents. In other words, that part of my grandparents, I didn't know. There was a farm in Illinois that we visited a couple times. So he was a guy that, you know, uh, came through the depression and, you know, made his way to the, you know, University of Illinois where I met my mother. My mother was from a much more middle-class family mm -hmm. and they met at, at the University of Illinois right after the Red Grange era. Uh -huh. uh, but they, you know, they graduated right near the depression, um, actually on the, on the cusp of it, the beginning of the depression. So my father was lucky to get a job in Detroit as an accountant, uh, and that's what he studied at Illinois and, and uh, worked for the Detroit Edison Company. We were, uh, up, I would say, a middle-class family in a middle-class, upper-middle-class suburb. Mm -hmm. um, so we lived on a street with, you know, uh, lots of kids. This was, you know, post-war baby boom. Right. Uh, GI country. Bill, everyone can yeah. buy a house and have a car. Yeah, they all, yeah, and, and Detroit's a big car city. So we, you know, we knew every single car that would come down. And when a Studebaker came that looked, you know, the front, you couldn't tell the front from the back. That was like the biggest thing yeah. in our neighborhood. Um, so we put on a carnival when we were kids, and seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old for polio. Polio was a big deal right. um, when we were growing up. So we had a friend uh, that lived in the next, over the next block um, who, who died, you know, of, of polio. So it was a it was kind of a threat, and everybody thought it was coming from the water, you know, in the lake. The lake we, we live right near Lake St. Clair, so yeah. they closed all the swimming. Um, I just received a call um, three days ago from probably my oldest friend, uh, who I <clears throat> who lived behind us across a field. His name was Charlie Harris, and you know he was a he was a wild wild kid who loved chemistry and he became a um, tenured professor at uh, Berkeley yeah. and head of the department of uh, ast chem you know, biophysics or biochemist biochemistry. Very, now he's very famous, but he has Parkinson's. He just called me the other day. and left me a voicemail for my birthday. Wow. You know, it was amazing. Charlie I mean, that's Harris. one of the things <clears throat> that, that I really <clears throat> admire about how you've lived your life is you stayed really close with these right. friends that you've had your entire life. Like right. it's not just Charlie, you've got like four or five of them right. that you visit every year and you really are in contact with in a way that, that I don't have in my life. It's not my experience. Well, I, my book, uh, you probably didn't read the, the um, dedication, uh, which is in the first few pages of the, of the book. This is the George yeah. Marshall book. Um, and I dedicated it to um, Mike and Charlie. Yeah. Um, and they are two of my oldest, not the Charlie Harris, uh, who's the, the guy I knew when I was four years Charlie old, but Yonkers. another Charlie. And Mike, who I played football with in high school. Um, and they are you know, two of my closest friends. Um, and we still see each other. And like next week, All I'm going to go uh, have birthday uh, dinner with them. Yeah, and Charlie so, went on to become a successful Washington lawyer. And right. Mike was a was a frogman, which is kind of the prototype of the Na the Navy SEALs, right? Yeah, it it it, it was the, the 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 sort of the special ops group that preceded the SEALs right. and it turned into the SEALs. So yeah, he was in two tri two t uh, two uh, trips to Vietnam, yeah, um, and then uh, hunting diamonds in Brazil. So he's like a stud, you know. Yeah, um, and still you know, is. Yeah, well, you know, now he's seventy nine years, years old. So, so is Char Charlie is a has, uh, Ch Charlie and I both kind of turned away from the law when we were uh, 
you know, 15 years ago, said, we're not going to do this anymore. And so Charlie went to grad school, got a uh, master's in uh, English or, yeah, sorry, no, American history. And then I started writing books. So right. uh, we kind of went that way. Well, Charlie's <clears throat> an amazing guy. Yep. You know, a true renaissance Connector. man, a gentleman, a, a very charismatic individual. Right, right, right. Good friends. So you grew up with these guys. You right. end up playing football in high school. Right. I mean, it's it's an all American story in right. many ways. And uh, yeah, high school. Uh, you know, girls. I met your I met your mother uh, when she was sixteen. Uh-huh. Uh, actually, I met her when we were in ninth grade. Uh, but when we were on a trip out west together, I can get into that later. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I met so I've known I've known my my wife now of mm. fifty plus years um, since high school. So that's like unusual. I yeah. Think, you know. Well, most mm. of my friends' parents are are divorced. You know, yeah. you guys have really you know made it work over right. the long haul. Like when you think back on how yeah. that unfolded and how you continue to you know work on your relationship right. and you know keep the love alive. Like to what do you attribute that? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's you know, it's not, it, it's not like it was, it's, it's not like it's easy to have, uh-huh. a, a, you know, a smooth relationship over that uh, amount of time. And of course it's morphed, it's changed. It's, uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty amazing. It uh, is. Pretty amazing. So, you know. Uh, we, <laughs> How many years is it? <laughs> well, we got married in 1963, yeah. right? To, you know, while I was still in uh-huh. law school, so. Ever since then, when it was, it's a uh, long time. Yeah, it's getting there. Um, yeah, mid fifties. Uh huh. Um, so, actually, about your age, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that's, uh, and you know, I, <laughs> I, my wife is sitting not far. From <laughs> She's here. right off camera over here. <laughs> so, um, careful. No, with I your mean, words. we. You know, when we were growing up, the idea of a divorce was scandalous. And my mother, <clears throat> my mother was a real gossip. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, at, at at dinner table, there would be all kinds of disparaging <laughs> remarks about people who were either seeing psychiatrists or on the, and there was one woman in our neighborhood was seeing a psychiatrist. It's like a huge scandal. Right. At least my mother built it up to be, <laughs> uh, you know, a sin. Uh-huh. Uh, and then you know, divorce was just, uh, and that and that happened to Mike, my one of the one of the two guys, that, mm-hmm. my, the the Frogman guy, uh, in the in, in the midst of high school, and it was front page newspaper news. Well, I remember one morning he came over for a ride to school with my father and myself, and, and that was the day the headlines came out. His 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 family was somewhat is somewhat prominent in the history of Detroit. Um, so they, it was like front page news. His parents were getting divorced, and that were, made that made the newspaper. Oh yeah, wow! And I think it was in the Detroit News. Yeah, it's like, you know, and Mike felt, you know, it was terrible. It was a terrible thing for him. Uh, well, that yeah. must have played on your psyche over the years no, as an impediment to divorce. You don't, you, I mean, know, you, don't, you, you don't, you don't stay married for that long no. without having moments no. where it no. looks like it might break. Right, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so and you don't, you don't let that happen. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a, that's exactly right. And I'm sure it's, you know, without you know, Charlie and Mike have, have been married as long as, as I have. And Charlie Harris, the other, the other guy, the, the Berkeley professor, mm-hmm. you know, has been diver- divorced three times. So, yeah. You know. <clears throat> well, to be yeah. clear though, you know, I don't want anyone yeah. to get the impression that you're, you're in it just because like you've, right. you've said to me many times, even over the last year, like, you know, I'm really in love with your mom. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's no small thing. No, no that's right. You know, and, and she's in love with me. Yeah. Was yeah. Everett a, a taskmaster or what kind of dad was he? Everett was, uh, I think he was laconic in a way. He was, he, he didn't say a lot. Part of it was <laughs> my had, mother. My mother was a gregarious social person, and he was much more, much quieter. Uh, but you know, he had a commanding, you know, uh, way about him. Part of it, though, was just due to the fact that he had a hearing defect, um, and you know, it, so it it 
it hindered him in sort of socialization. Like laconic uh, in the sense of yeah. being emotionally disconnected yeah, and distant? Yeah, not, not really, yeah. You know, but when he said stuff or criticized me, which is rarely rare, but he did, you know, that was like, oh my God, what if I, you know, I've, you know, right. losing his respect. Um, so, um, you know, and I had a, a very um, extraordinary older brother, much older than I was, eight or nine years. So, and he was, you know, he was, as we were growing up, you know, he was like Mr. Big uh, in terms of having a, I think they even, they, they used to take us and have, we had our IQs, you know, done. So I, his IQ was like. <laughs> and everybody oh, knew what everyone's IQ yeah. score was? Well, I, well he's, I just knew he's his. A academic, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, a, he, he's of a prodigious academic. He's mind. a nuclear physicist yeah. and a and an extraordinary French horn player. So, uh, you know, but, you know, sort of had real problems with social, social skills. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so he was always the, you know, the the, uh, the the person that you know that I that I had to live up to in some ways intellectually. Yeah. Um, but I was never, you know, in his league. I don't think. <clears throat> did that make you yeah. resentful? No. I, the one thing it, it did was I said I'm not going to the same college he went to. Yeah. And you know I could have gone where he went and decided to go to a, you know, where I could, you know. Uh, excel, you know, not a, uh, I wanted to play football, you know, mm-hmm. so, uh, I went to go to a division, division three. It didn't back then. It wasn't that way, but it was a small school. Yeah. You know, Amherst so. college. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, what, you know, one of the things that I think <clears throat> we share is, you know, we're both, we're both competitive and we're both ambitious. Driven. I, yeah. Very, very driven. Um, and I feel, I feel like you, had this sense that you wanted to, you know, get out of Detroit and make a name for yourself yeah, yeah. and do something different on your own terms. Is that fair? Well, except I didn't get out of Detroit at first. Um, you know, what I what I really want to do is get out of law school fast and start making money and see, you know, whether I can make a name uh, in the legal profession. But, you know, and I didn't have, it, I went into the law school without a lot of, circumspection about I got to be a lawyer. That was always what I wanted to do. I always wanted to go into court or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a good profession. You could, you could, you know, make a living at it. And it was a big deal to have a job, you know, uh, getting out of college. Um, And my parents, you know, that was a huge thing with them, which you got to get a job. Right. You know, uh, so. So, so uh, after Amherst, I mean, you fast tracked your law school experience, right? Didn't you start in the summertime? Started the day after I graduated from uh, college. Uh, literally, we drove all night. I remember uh, from Amherst to to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they dropped me off um, at the law school at eight in the morning. You know, I had an eight o'clock class. It was the first class in law wow. school. Uh, and that's where I met the famous Kurt Ledke. Standing, oh, that's right. Standing outside the door of our classroom, uh, smoking cigarettes. It's a classic story. So for those that are listening, Kurt Ludke is kind of a notorious, famous character who was your roommate for a period of time and ended up right. late. He became a journalist and then became a screenwriter in a second act of his career. Right. Um, kind of famously announced, I'm going to be a screenwriter now. And everybody laughed. And his first, <clears throat> his first screenplay was called Absence of Malice right. that ended up getting directed by Sidney Pollack, starring Paul Newman and Sally Field. And his second screenplay- It was nominated for- That nominated, one was yeah, nominated for- Academy For Award. Best Original Screenplay, right. Oscar nomination. His second screenplay was Out of Africa. Right. And the third right. one was a bust. What, yeah, Random Hearts. Random and Hearts. And then he right. kind of never came back from that. Well, he just didn't want to do it. Yeah. He th- and he also never, he, he refused to go to Los Angeles, yeah. right? He calls everybody in Los Angeles scum. <laughs> <laughs> I think he like made Sidney Pollack come to Michigan to meet with him. That's right. I mean, Sid, you know, Sidney Pollack, like a legend of, you know, Hollywood filmmaking right. at the time. But at that time, when you met him, he was kind of a carousing, notorious character. Right. right? We had in law school, we, there were three of us. Four of us actually uh, living in a in a you know in the law quad as they called it. And, but Kurt, um, he never 
he never went to class except if the class was in the mid to late afternoon. He would go. Otherwise, uh-huh. he didn't go to any classes. Right. Wasn't uh, he dating like yeah. a nurse? In yeah, the she hospital? didn't get off until midnight. <laughs> so uh-huh. it was kind of a difficult, uh, you know, I had to kind of get out of there to, to study. <clears throat> but anyway, we had we had a good time. Right. And <laughs> and, and so uh, you you then end up getting a job at a law firm in mm-hmm. in Detroit. You yeah. move back to Gross Point. You meet my well. You reconnect with mom because she was well, she went, was an undergrad yeah. at Michigan when right. you were in law when school. When I started law school, she was still uh, you know in her senior year, uh, and then the uh, the the second summer I took off rather than stay in law school, and we got married that summer, in nineteen sixty three, uh-huh. um, and and then we lived in a, a little apartment near the stadium, at the University of Michigan. Um, for my final year, and Nan- and my wife Nancy um, was uh, studied um, <clears throat> speech and hearing, and got a job right away as you know in a local uh, school. So we finished yeah. that out. Then I got a job. Started working in Detroit. We lived in Detroit um, for a couple of years, and then moved into Gross Point, where I grew up. And right. that's when I started thinking about going somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple uh, things. First of all, over the years, you 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 always had a knack for having like an iconic car. Like you had a Dodge Dart, what? and then we had a we had a VW Beetle, and then I remember you had that like navy that that like midnight blue navy uh, Mustang. Mustang. That was a beautiful car. Yeah. yeah. 19, uh, what is it, 1964, 65, I think it was. I think they came out in 64. We got one in 65. Yeah. And there's a great photo of you uh, in your diapers, uh, you know, when you're t- two or one and a half, helping me wash that Mustang. I, I know that uh, photo. And, uh, you know, that was a big deal. Uh, I think for you, I think more more for you than for me. <laughs> uh, well, I look at that but, photo and I'm like, oh, man, if you'd only uh, hung on to that car. But the first car I had that when I went to Amherst, you weren't supposed to have cars. Amherst is in Amherst, Massachusetts. It's a small, uh, all men's college. So I had my mother uh, didn't realize what she was doing, but she let me have her English Anglia. This was the worst English product. It was an English Ford. Uh, And I don't know why she bought it. It was the cheapest car you could possibly buy. In the United States, I think, and it was like almost made out of cardboard. I've never even heard of that. Yeah, well, I had it at Amherst secretly, you know, and you know, parked in town somewhere, so I could use it. And um, actually, when Nancy came to visit me for you know the annual big uh, weekend, <clears throat> she came with an, another uh, another young lady from uh, Gross Point who was dating my you know one of my best friends. They came to Amherst for the weekend, and while we were in that English Anglia, uh, we got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I forgot exactly how it happened. We were, I guess, I was, we were speeding or something, and then we ended up in the Amherst uh, Police Department headquarters. Uh, this little police department, and they, uh, oh, because I, I was because I was supposed to have a car, uh, and. You know, I was an Amherst student, and you're it was not actually to, against the law. Well, it was against the regulations of the of the of the college, uh-huh. and I had to go before an uh, before a uh, a court a, a court of honor, an honor court mm. at Amherst, and uh, I don't know, I was suspended <laughs> or something. <laughs> Adjudicate like your, yeah. this transgression of yeah, driving a car <laughs> yeah. without permission of the of the college, uh-huh. uh, and then I think you could have a car when you were a senior. But anyway, we used to drive that. That uh, that car back and forth from Amherst to uh, uh, to Michigan, and it was you know an adventure because it would it would constantly break down and right uh, and so forth. We didn't have enough money to go on the turnpike, so we would drive the back roads in the English Anglia all the way uh-huh. you know, between It'd break down on yeah, some uh, country uh, lane I, next to a, a cornfield. I, I can't imagine anybody's interested in any of this. Stuff. <laughs> I am. This stuff. Well, I I mean, so when is uh, the you know, when is this idea of like moving to to Washington okay. like enter your consciousness? I mean, y- y- 
was there a sense like this is where the action is? Like yeah, I want to be yeah. involved in in you right. know this, this is where things are happening and right. important people are making important decisions. And I so this be was part of Nixon that. when the, the early Nixon, uh, and actually there was a lot of reform going on in Washington. Of course, it, it was preceded by Kennedy's "Ask What You Can," you know, right. you can do and so forth. Uh, but I was I I wanted to be a big time antitrust lawyer. Which means you know, litigating against corporations on you know economic issues and breaking up breaking up big business that kind of thing. I was really entranced with the idea of you know there's too much monopoly power in the uh, in the American economy, and it was it was a, you know it was an exciting field, and I couldn't get enough of it uh, at the law firm I was with in Michigan. And then this book came along, uh, who, who now this one of my really good friends, uh, a book called uh, the first the first expose of, of the big law firms in Washington, mm. and it was called uh, the Super Lawyers. So it was uh, about a bunch of the guys at at the big law firms in uh, they weren't big then, but the major law firms in Washington, and it was about what they did. They did huge kinds of interesting pro bono work. You know, they were arguing Supreme Court cases. They were breaking up companies or defending the companies. It was written by a guy named Joe Goulden. And Joe Goulden now is in his 90s, but he's one of my really good friends. And he's been mentoring me on writing books ever since I started. Wow, I never knew that. And he just lives like two blocks away. Uh, so he's, you know, been my big fan. You know, I, I wrote an op-ed piece a few weeks ago about NATO. <clears throat> and I wanted to get it published, you know, in a decent newspaper. And, you know, you send it to the Times or the Post, and they don't know who you are. Yeah. But he helped me get it uh, published, not in the greatest newspaper of all, but it was the Washington Times. Uh, it was the first time we got an op-ed piece, and, he, you know, he, he made it happen. Anyway, so then I had a really good friend from Amherst who was uh, working in Washington, and he called me one day and said, if you ever want to come to Washington, call this guy. Uh, so I Joe called, Golden? No, this was a different, different, different guy. guy, yeah. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine that I went to Amherst with who was working in the Justice Department. He said, if you ever want to uh, do antitrust in, in Washington, call this guy. So I called the guy, and he was an FTC uh, guy, you know, recruiting lawyers. And at the time, Ralph Nader, and nobody who's listening to this has probably ever heard of Ralph Nader. Yeah, Nader, Nader. But, I mean, he's, but, you know, famous... <laughs> Perhaps most famous for the Pinto thing. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Ralph Nader uh, had, had had this group of hotshot young lawyers that were called Ra uh, Nader's Raiders, and they went into the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and they I identified all kinds of scandals and corruption and so forth. The, the FTC uh, pre Nixon was you know filled with a lot of Southern guys that were just kind of living off the land. And they, so they, and as a result, they had a lot of investigations. They cleaned house. And they brought in a, a really respected uh, chairman of the FTC, Miles mm -hmm. Kirkpatrick from Philadelphia. And he was staffing the FTC with all these young hotshots. And I wanted to be a young hotshot. So I got a great job there. I just, I was just very lucky. Um, and I was head, I headed up, you know, a quarter of the antitrust cases that they were doing. I had 28. Suddenly I had, I was 32 years old. I had 20, 28 or 29, 30 lawyers working for me. Wow. And we were investigating the oil industry. Mm -hmm. It was like heaven, you know, mm. or that we, we went after Xerox at the time, which had 99% of the market in, in, in copying. Uh, so we, you know, we were, and we had economists and we went around. And there was like a new energy in that yeah, yeah, organization yeah, yeah. to really like affect change. And we, it was the best job I ever had. And we, I, yeah, I probably should have stayed in it longer, but stayed in it for three years. Uh, and there was a lot of esprit. It was we versus them. The best lawyers in Washington were always on the other side. So we were the young guys that were trying to break uh -huh. them up. Right. We probably wasted a lot of taxpayer. I'm sure we wasted a lot of taxpayer money <laughs> on our cases. Um, but we, you know, we, we, we sued, we, the, we sued the, oil industry, which are the big eight companies mm -hmm. under a new, you know, shared monopoly kind of theory. Uh, so it was lots of fun. Uh, How long yeah. were you at the FTC? Yeah, about three years. Three years? Yeah. Oh, see, yeah. I thought it was longer than that. Uh -uh. No, it's not 70. Uh, so I was out. I was, 
went in in 1972 and came out about three years later. And I, and I thought, I always thought I'd go back to my law firm in Detroit because I was a partner in that law firm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they wanted me to come back and so forth. But I decided to interview. Um, <clears throat> so with law firms um, from the FTC, you had to be careful ethically about uh, starting the interview process. But the big law firms are looking for people, you know, coming out of the FTC and coming out of the Justice Department. Um you know, to defend the companies that are being sued by all these guys. Right. So um, I interviewed, actually came close to working for Sidley and Austin, which was the Chicago-based firm that was handling all the ATT. After I left, uh, at about the time I left the, uh, the FTC, they were going after a- the whole AT&T telephone system right. and breaking it up. So Sidley and Austin was defending all those companies, and they wanted you know people like me. So... I went to Chicago, interviewed them, and then I, got, I, I also was interviewed by the firm I ended up with uh, going to, was Steptoe & Johnson, because I had met uh, the head of the antitrust practice at Steptoe when I was in the FTC. He was on the other side uh-huh. of the case. Uh, so but I, ultimately, this presents uh, a scenario in which you're jumping the fence and changing yeah. sides, right? Did mm-hmm. they, was there any kind of ethical dilemma <clears throat> around that? Didn't cause me a lot of problems. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, it then, you know, this was a, a very prestigious law firm in Washington. Uh, they were bringing me in as a partner. You know, if I'd gone in that firm as an associate, I don't know whether I would have made partner. Um, I didn't go to Harvard or Yale Law School, which is where most of them uh, came from, Harvard, Yale, Stanford. Yeah. Uh, so Michigan was, you know, it was a, a, a top rank law school, but it wasn't in the you know, in the higher. Right. So this was your <clears throat> entree, your opportunity to, to kind, kind of, of yeah, be come with, in be and with the big boys. See if I could swim in that, yeah. uh, in that atmosphere. And how old were you? Uh, so. Like 35? No, I was, no, I was 35. Yes. 35. But a, a part, that was the one about the age when you became mm-hmm. partner at that point. Right. Uh, but I had to prove myself when I got in there. So, and so yeah. I think I was six or something when we moved to Washington. Mm-hmm. So I must have been 10 or something like that when you joined Stepto. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or nine. Right. Yeah. Nine or ten. Right. Yeah. And the, yeah, you were thrown into the, uh, you know, to the Washington scene, <laughs> so to speak, and getting beat up on the street corner while you were waiting for the bus. Yeah. <laughs> I had a well documented. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm interested in in but in but, in how you remember me at that period of time. Like, I just remember myself being kind of a sensitive kid who was a little bit awkward and uncomfortable in my own skin and sort of kind of bumbling around a uh, little, a little bit good. confused. Like I was a sweet kid. I was a little introverted and, you know, kind of had difficulty making friends unless I was in like, you know, an optimal social environment. Well, yeah, but you had, the, you know, your best friend was Eric Melanie that right. lived right behind us. Uh, we had a and, neighborhood, yeah. It was and, a, you, you know, you ride your bikes around the neighborhood yeah. and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and you know, you went to the Bethesda Elementary School. It seemed like you were doing pretty well. I, but I know you yeah. were, were somewhat well, awkward. I think at Bethesda <laughs> Elementary, I didn't really know what was going on, uh. and then <laughs> I don't think I was off to an excellent academic start, but. Perhaps around the time that you joined Stepto, so you know, suddenly we went from, you know, very much middle class to you then, you know, having, you know, making a much better living. Yeah. Right. And then you were able to send me to St. Patrick's, and that was like an incredible environment in which I thrived. Right. And I kind of, you know, came out of my skin at that period of time. I can't remember how you got to St. Patrick's. I, I mean, don't. I have no a idea. A bus or na- your mother drove. I mean, you? it wasn't close to yeah. home. I think there yeah. was. I think you you drove me or took me to a. Bu- I think there was a bus stop. Yeah. There was one of those, like at one of the circles, Westmoreland Circle or something like that, where you would drop me off and I'd take a but, bus. But I remember when you were waiting for the bus, or was it? Yeah, well, you were waiting for the bus, uh, and there was that guy that that used to, you know, make your life miserable. Uh, well, that was and, Bethesda Elementary, I think, yeah. taking my hat and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, there was a yeah, lot we were, of that. We were <laughs> worried about, you know, there was this tough kid in the neighborhood, you know, that was mm. harassing you. Uh, but we were, you know, I think it was, uh, from my perspective, I, you know, I didn't think you were, 
you know, having acad- certainly not having academic problems or, you know, learning or anything like that. You were a smart, smart kid. You liked to read. You, you know, you were picking up on everything. Um, you know, I we 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 played around with sports because I was you know interested yeah. in that. You know, and soccer that didn't seem to go so well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I played soccer for yeah. a number of years, but I was absolutely you know hopeless. <laughs> but of course, you know, the minute you hit the water, that was like you know that was where you belonged, and yeah. uh, and I think you know, and you were incentivized by just getting a trophy, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing like, you know, success to, you know, inspire a young person. Right. I mean, I was naturally good at it. And then, of course, you gravitate towards, you know, what you're, you're you know, sort of getting accolades in. And I was naturally good at it. Although I think, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think I was on a swim team when I was like seven yeah. or something. It, I didn't, it, it wasn't until like I was 10 and then I started getting good. Getting serious. Yeah. yeah. And then it became like kind of really serious. But, you know, I remember those St. Patrick years, like in elementary school, very fondly. And then I went off to Landon and that became a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry about that. There's uh, nothing to apologize. Uh, I mean, I remember being very excited to get into that school. I mean, it was like this prestigious prep school and you had to apply and, you know, it was a big deal. You know, and I wanted to do well, but I, I, you know, in retrospect, looking back, like, I don't think it was the right environment for me. Well, but St. Patrick's, though, is, are the ones, they are the ones that said you should go there. Is, and, did they say that? Yeah, they I said, well, that. you know, we don't think you should go to St. Albans because I don't know what, because two, and and uh, Sidwell doesn't give you enough structure, you know, and they were the ones, I think, that sort did of directed they? you there. And So it's know. their fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think they had a lot to do with that. But anyway, it it was in an, it was not far away, and it was, uh, it uh, you know, and and I felt for you in some of those situations. Um, I mean, looking back on it, I've made I've really uh, made peace with a lot of it. I think I held on to a resentment about it for a long time, and you know, I've I've, I've exerted a lot of energy to kind of work through all of that. And I would say that reconnecting with um, Tom Scott, yeah. and then participating in the Nantucket Project um, last year, and seeing a bunch of people from my class who also attended that was incredibly healing, and has given me kind of a revisionist perspective on it. That's allowed me to feel a lot better about it. And the truth is, like, look, these are you know one percenter, you know, problems. Like, I had the privilege of growing up in a family where you guys could provide everything that I needed right. and, you know, send me to these, these, these amazing academic institutions that gave me an incredible, um, you know, head start. But I think, I think one advantage of it that you, you know, you're, you, you have real, you, you know, that you had that, that came out of it. Some, it, a real, I mean, look, your life was not that tough no. uh, in, you know, in, in almost all respects, but, you know, the one thing that they said was, you know, you can't, you know, swim with this club team uh, because you're going to miss mandatory football in the, in the fall or baseball or lacrosse in the spring. And they had this very rigid uh, sports program at, at Landon. And you can't miss that. Whereas if you want to be a top swimmer, you got to work out in the morning. Uh, and then you got to work out in the afternoon and it's, you know, you just have to do that. And you took it upon yourself to go to the administration and make your case and say, look, I have to do this. And if I can't, you know, if, if you can't, if you won't let me, I'm going to have to leave the school. Mm-hmm. Big threat. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they were <laughs> quaking in their boots over that. No, they were. Ultimatum. They didn't, but they, but you were doing it well academically. Very well academically, and they didn't want to lose you. You know, you were going to be one of the kids that's going to get into Harvard or you know Stanford or whatever, uh, swimming or not. So uh, you know, and they uh, they respected somebody who was coming and make his case. I think he did it in writing. Uh, well, so, I had um, a I had a, an ally in the headmaster. Well, <laughs> Malcolm Coates, yeah. who who actually you know liked me and was a fan right. and was a, a support system for me. Um, the athletic department was not 
you know, looking upon that as kindly. And who was the coach again that? Well, it was Lowell Davis, Lowell Davis. was the athletic director. And he just had it in him that he was going to defeat me no right. matter what. And I'm like this little skinny 15 year old kid who's just saying like, I want to go swim with this club team, swim in the morning, swim in the afternoon. I don't want to do sports at Landon. I'm not going to like, I remember the headmaster saying, well, what happens later in life when, you know, you, you go to the club and you're going to play tennis? And I just thought, well, that's not my life. I'm not going right. to be that. That's not the guy that I'm going to be. I want to do, I really am committed to trying to be excellent in this regard. And right. it confounded me and confused me and angered me that they couldn't see that and wouldn't support that. And so I really did, like, I put it in writing and you helped me, like, you helped me make a case. Like, we had to litigate this and it yeah. was not an overnight thing. At first they said no, and it went through all these iterations until finally they relented. And I think if I'm, uh, if I'm correct, that at least at that time, I was the only person they had ever yeah. exempted from their athletic department to allow me to go do this thing, which I then did. And they're gonna, they said, if this kid gets away with it, what's going to yeah, happen? Yeah, like, what's the precedent? It's a slippery, Next time you're gonna, slippery gonna, slope right. argument. Right. Um, and then I think junior year is when I wanted to participate in the high school, the local high school swimming championships, metros. Right. And in order to do that, your high school had to have a swim team. <laughs> and my high school did not have a swim team. So I started one. Right. It was, there was one member. Oh, <laughs> was the only one. one. Wasn't there one other guy? I don't, I don't think that so, guy, but yeah. I had to piggyback on these other high school meets in order to like right. go through the ramifications right. of, of qualifying and then ended up you know, doing well at that meet. And to this day, there is a swim team at Landon now. Right. And I right. feel like I helped birth that in my own right. you know, kind of uh, inelegant way, but that was quite a saga. And I will say, mm-hmm. you know, also, you know, I have to thank you for supporting me in pursuing that dream because it was, you know, it was like an off center thing and it required you waking up with me at 4.30 yeah, was, every morning and see, driving me to swim practice. Secretly hoping it wouldn't yeah. get in. Uh, so, no. And you did that you in, in the little MG and you would drive me to swim practice and you would sit in the car while I was training in the dark cold and like mark up these briefs, like work in the car until I was done. And you did that until I could get a driver's license. And that was a huge thing. And I think about that all the time. I think about that when, you know, now we're in the, this this situation where, you know, our home is fractured and Julie and I are living in two different places during the week. And, right. you know, we're trying to support Mathis and art school and it's not easy. And I think, like well, my dad swim. got up and drove me to swim practice at 4.30 in the morning. Like, this is the least I can do to pay it forward for my own child. But the good thing is you don't have to go to swim meets every Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's the harder part, oh my right? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Yeah driving out to Bowie and sitting in a, a steamy chlorinated natatorium for I used to seven actually, hours. I used to actually take boxes of documents. This is in the days, you know, way before computers when it, when we did all our antitrust cases with documents and it'd take a box of documents to the swimming meet. Yeah. I could finish a whole box mm. during the during a swimming meet uh, because people who aren't used to that don't realize it, but their child only has about you know, two minutes of glory and during right. an entire and day. Eight hours, of, right. you know, dr- and driving to these, right. you know, places way out in the middle of nowhere. But, but you did that. We, well, yeah. And we became kind of, you know, uh, pa- the, the kind of parents that, you know, that are aggressively, you know, involved with, and not like we were screaming at anybody or anything like that, but we were, we were pushing it, you know, and we wanted you to, succeed and we we knew how happy it made you and of course not just you but our daughter as well Mm -hmm. so um i felt that i mean you you were never like the you know the the crazy parent on the you know in the stands yelling or anything like that but there was definitely um a sense if not an expectation that you will succeed yeah you know and i felt that and i shouldered that and i was able to fulfill that, I think, in certain respects, but I also think I paid, you know, I paid a toll for that as well. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think it, it, it also exempted you from some of the knocks, the knocks that you would might otherwise receive going through high school, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, 
you got to maybe get a part-time job, maybe learn more about girls, maybe learn more mm-hmm. about social stuff, maybe get into a little trouble, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with alcohol or whatever. Uh, but Earlier. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And learn, you know, not being exposed to, and Landon, of course, is, you know, there was a social scene at Landon that you weren't in. No, I, I not only did I exempt myself from the athletic program, I exempted myself from right. the social environment right. there completely. And, of, and I lived a very monk-like existence. Yeah. I would wake yeah. up ridiculously early. I'd go to some practice. I, you know, get through school. I, whenever there was a study hall, I would fall asleep on a desk. I was exhausted all the time, and would go to swim practice after school and then do my homework and be asleep by nine o'clock every day. And there was, and then weekends were swim meets. Right. And And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. And the kids at Landon knew, knew, knew knew that that's, that's what you were doing. Uh, So, you know, the proms, I didn't get in trouble. I didn't like, I didn't do any of that normal stuff. And so you had to face up to it. But I was, but I was very driven. I was like, I'm going to get into all these schools and I got into all of them. And, you know, that was like, a, you know, I mean- 12 for 12 It or was whatever. pretty epic yeah. to get into like basically every college you apply to, right. you know? And I think, you know, there was a, you know, I f- obviously that's gonna make you feel good, mm. but I'd also, I felt, you know, I felt like the weight of that too, I think. Like, what, I is it, what, does, that, what does that mean? And like, what is, how does that impact like the choices you're gonna make later in life with what you're gonna do with yourself? Yeah. I thought- an interesting thing, you know, that I always thought you and Neil Phillips would go off to Harvard hmm. and you know, talk about Neil Phillips and and how he was regarded at Lane and how you were and how you came together. Sure. So Neil Phillips was the best athlete in our school and Landon School was a boys prep school. It was small and exclusive. There were only like 60 people in my class. Neil was African-American, a very gifted athlete, an incredible, an incredibly charismatic individual and intelligent, the best basketball player, the best football player. He played, he played all three sports, baseball, gets into Harvard. Um, I mean, just, you know, on this incredible trajectory towards success. And he has blazed quite an amazing path for himself. He is now regarded as um, a great civil rights leader right. on behalf of, you know, he's championing underprivileged African-American boys. And he now founded and runs this school in Florida and travels a lot. He's an incredibly um, prolific public speaker. At the Nantucket Project this past fall, he interviewed George W. Bush on stage, and it was riveting. It was absolutely riveting to see two people from very different perspectives come together for you know a compelling talk was something to behold. And you know he's marched with John Lewis, and he's done a lot of amazing things. And I have so much respect for you know what he's done with his life, and you know to be able to reconnect with him this past fall. Was but you really connected with him back me. then, didn't you? When when you both got into a Harvard, bit. yeah, I got into Harvard, <laughs> yeah. and I, I ended up not going. And there are listen. There's plenty of times where I think you know maybe I made a mistake. You know, yeah. I, I know that you would have preferred me to go there, and look for good reason. You know, who says no to that? Right. Like, who am I to? decline right. that opportunity that right. nobody gets, right. you know? And how would my life have been different, you know? It's hard to say. It's hard to say, and I can't spend a lot of time, yeah. you know, entertaining that, but um, but uh, it definitely would have been different, right. I think. Right. Um, but I was happy, you know, at Stanford, and that's when I started, right. you know, making all of these mistakes right. and kind of sowing some wild oats that I never did in high school. Right. And, you know, I Same think, thing would have happened at Harvard. But I think a lot of it is a it was the expression of, you know, repressed emotions that I didn't understand and really didn't know how to process about right. like what I was doing and like what makes me happy. I was on this path towards success and upward mobility without ever taking a moment to right. stop and say, well, like what am I like what do I want to do? What do I want to be? What it what makes me happy? Because I, I do think that I was an offbeat kid and I think I you know, had I not had I not gotten into any colleges, I would have done some kind of you know offbeat artistic thing. You know, but I was on this path towards being a consultant or an investment banker or a lawyer or a doctor, and 
then, you know, alcohol entered the equation and then all bets were off, you know, and hence, you know, ushered in a very painful period, you know, not just for me, but for you. I mean, what I put you guys through, yeah, that, you yeah, know. That, that was painful. Yeah. Um, talk about, uh, for a second, I'm interviewing you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, about Michigan, because Michigan was always on the horizon uh, because of your grandfather and you went there. And is that the first time you started drinking? I think, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that it, yeah. I th it's the first. I'm going to put on my Michigan you're gonna hat. Put, you're going to put your Michigan hat on. <laughs> uh, I, went on a, I went on a recruiting trip to the University of Michigan. I was, I was recruited there by the great John Urbanchek, who was the coach at the time. Still like my favorite swim coach ever. I, think, I just think he's the best. And he was really rebuilding the program at that period of time and trying to create something you know, uh, noteworthy and remarkable. Um, with the yeah, he got that, that guy, other guy younger than you that made the Olympics, right? From from Washington. Yeah. Uh, the, Tom Dolan. No, no, it was well, the other guy. Well, Michael Phelps. No, it was before that, there was a guy that did the canoeing. Oh, Mike Barrowman. Barrowman, who yeah, got, who got a medal. Yeah, yeah, Mike Barrowman, famous Olympic swimmer. <laughs> um, and, you know, for those that didn't read my book, or are kind of coming into this, you know, green. Oh, I forgot it's in your book, right? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of people who listen to this haven't yeah. read the book. Um, my mother, who's sitting right over here, her father was a champion swimmer at the University of Michigan in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, I believe he was captain of the team in yes, 1929. Uh, an Olympic hopeful. Tried out for the uh, Olympics in 32. In right? 32, and he got third or fourth, whatever the the one, I think they were taking three at the time and he yeah. got fourth. Yeah. So he missed by one slot, if Backstrom. I'm not mistaken. He actually held the American record in the 150 yard backstroke, <laughs> which is an event they don't do anymore. Right. I mean, he held an American record. It's really quite yeah. amazing. And when you visit... Um, the University of Michigan Natatorium. It's called the Matt Man Natatorium. That was his coach at right. the time, legendary swim coach. And along the hallways, they have all of the old team photos and you can find his photo on the wall. Right. And now it's hanging in my container office. There's a picture in the book. And I never had the opportunity to meet him because he passed away before I was born. He died of a heart attack at age 54. Um, and I know that, that that was, you know, a very traumatic experience in in my mother's life and Nancy's right. life. Uh, and I never really thought that much about him. I mean, I would hear stories about him, but I didn't really connect with his legacy emotionally until, um, you know, I, I went on this own, you know, my own journey with alcohol and, and then, you know, later on the second bottom of like, you know, reconfiguring my lifestyle that I started thinking about him a lot more. And now at 52, I think about him all the time right. because I'm two years shy of when he passed away. And in so many ways, I feel this kinship with this person that I've never met. And so certainly that was part of the allure of, you know, attending Michigan. And I thought, you know, long and hard about, about doing that. But to get back to your question, yeah, I went on a recruiting trip to Michigan and there was a swim meet going on during that visit. Uh, and then after the meet, there was a, there was a big party. And I remember being in um, somebody's apartment and there was a keg party uh, and, you know, everybody's drinking. And I think maybe I'd had a beer or two. It wasn't like my first beer yeah, ever right, or anything right. like that. But um, this was the first time that I was in like, an environment where I really wanted to be part of this social right. community. You know, I really like looked up to all of these athletes. And there was one moment in particular where um, there was the diver, Bruce Kimball. Oh, Bruce Kimball was that? Who yeah. was the most famous diver in the right. world other than Greg Louganis at the time. Right. Um, Olympic medalist. His father, uh, Dick Kimball, was the diving coach. Yeah, and, right. And Bruce Kimball- They were from Ann Arbor, yeah, right. Bruce Kimball uh, had a beer in his hand and he did the most amazing thing that I've ever seen to this day where he did, he was holding his keg <laughs> cup of beer and from a flat foot, he did a, he did a, a he jumped up in the air and did a backflip and landed on his feet 
holding this cup of beer and he didn't spill <laughs> any of it. And I thought that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Whatever that guy has, like, I want it. And I was like, I'm in, let me have a beer, you know, and I got loaded that night um, and ended up partying with him. Of course, you know, the, the sort of postscript to that story is Bruce Kimball would later um, careen his car oh, into yeah, a right. crowd of people killing oh, I know. at least one person and going to jail. You know, yeah. he's, you know he's an alcoholic, right. um, destroyed his life, destroyed his career. Uh, you know, and when I say like, I want what that guy has, like I did, you know, and then I ended up going on, you know, uh, a less tragic version of that trajectory yeah. in, in a way that I couldn't have foreseen. Do you think Urbanchek knew what was going on with the team when you were recruiting? No, I mean, listen, you know, I think all of these coaches, whether they're swim coaches or, you know, football, co they know, they know these kids are partying, yeah. but, you know, they, they cast a little bit of a blind eye. They have to keep a loose grip on this. Like they have yeah. to let these kids, you know, do what they're going to do in college. They can't over police it. So I think on some level they kind of know and they make a choice to yeah. not get too involved. And I don't know what it's like now, but you know, it was a free for all when, when I was in school. Well, do you think Skip knew? Yeah, it's the same thing. You know, yeah. I think he kind of knew um, and kind of decided to, you know, not make too too big of a deal. You guys weren't it. doing drugs. They were mainly drinking, right? It was drinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I never, I never saw, I mean, once in a while you'd see some kid doing hard drugs in college, but it wasn't part of my experience. Right. You know, it was just a very, it was a drinking culture. And at that time at Stanford, I mean, you could roll a keg into the stands and just, you know, have at right. it and go crazy. I mean, they, they don't let you do that anymore. No, it was the same when I was, was at Amherst. You know, it was, you know, whatever you wanted to do was, was right. fine. And it was just bananas. And I went crazy. I think I, you know, coming from a very structured environment to having that kind of freedom, um, I was ill prepared for that and I wasn't mature enough to, to handle it. And I just went full on, but I think there was a, you know, something tweaked inside of me because my relationship with alcohol was just different from everybody else. And I had a, if not a conscious awareness, a semi-conscious awareness of that from the very beginning, it just would take a very long time before yeah. I would do anything about it. And, you know, it just progressed over time until it got, you know, really dark and, and terrible. You know, right. and I put you guys through a huge amount of pain for which every time I'm I cross terribly Pico, sorry. Every time I cross Pico Avenue coming from the airport, I think about you used to live up there. Yeah, well, but, I lived on I lived on Marine off Main Street, and there was that time when you came and visited me where I was really at my nadir, yeah. um, and it was after you know the wedding that went awry and all of that, and it was just a yeah. super dark moment where I was like drinking in the it was morning. A Rose and Bowl. It was, it was yeah, a Rose Bowl. We went to the Rose Bowl. Uh, That's the last time Michigan. I can't. Yeah. I can't even think about that weekend without getting really upset. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I think it was right. really yeah. you know it was hard, be not because. Not because of the pain that I was in, but because of of how I conducted myself with you, right. you know. Right. But so, I think ultimately that that precipitated, you know, the solution. Because that was after that visit, you were like, "I'm done. Like you, you're you're right. you're kind of on your own. You know, we know what's going on, and if you want help, right. we're here from you. But you know, we don't we don't we we can't really you know participate in this anymore. Well, we helped you get some help. Yeah, you know. You which did. was, you know, uh, but I'll never forget that because it was the, partly because of Michigan. It was the Michigan yeah. national championship game. They mm -hmm. ended up sharing it with Nebraska, but, <clears throat> but it was Woodson in the, and so I actually had a pretty good time that day. <laughs> <laughs> after the actual, after the actual I, game. Yeah, because you got me out of the field. I right. was standing in the end zone, you know, mm. uh, at, during, during the third quarter of that yeah. game. <clears throat> so. But anyway, you know, um, I, I wanted to, you know, just publicly acknowledge that, you know, the support that you showed me during those difficult times, like really allowed me to um, get the help that I needed and to change my life. And, you know, it was just a, it was yeah. a really hard time for yeah. all of us. Very, very hard for us, um, Nancy and, and myself. Um, yeah, we... Because we had we had never experienced a you know 
a problem in our family like that. We had death, you know, Nancy's father death. That was, and you know, but well, my, and then her brother died. and her brother too. Yeah. On yeah, on top of it, uh, but you know, uh, but sort of a you know a a breakdown, you know, in the, in the family uh, uh, dynamic uh, was was very very difficult for for us to deal with, um, and we didn't know how to deal with it. And we didn't want to talk about it a lot, you know, with other people. Um, you know, here was our son, you know, really in trouble with alcohol. Seeing, fortunately, seeing a guy that you know got you into to the rehab, mm-hmm. which, uh, and then we all traveled to that, and that was like an amazing eye opener for me and Nancy and Molly, who your 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 sister, who family also, week, who went. I was. Chairman of the law firm at the time, and you know, part of the you know, part of the reason I stopped doing it as long as I could have um, was, the, I, you know, this whole thing, you know, uh, upset my life a lot. In the not in the sense that I, you know, I wanted to quit law or you know anything like that, but it was just like, hey, you know, there's more out there, and there are other things I can do. Um, than just you know keeping my head down and doing my three thousand hours a year or you know, and you know trying to run the law firm so it was uh it was uh, a, a time for it was a you know it actually was for me personally in the end it was a positive thing to go to have gone through that so i don't wow. feel um you know and i felt you know you think about more, a lot more about life. Um, so <clears throat> part of me also, also regrets the call I made. That, you know, I sort of triggered this whole thing in a way in terms of your path because uh, I remember when you were on the waiting list at Cornell Law School and I think the waiting list somewhere else, Georgetown or something. Yeah. Um, and I, And you were... <laughs> Spending the summer in New York, and got onto a a, a movie uh, project where you were helping out with a uh, production of a movie, and I called you up. And it was almost Labor Day, and said, "You know, if you want to go to law school, and I'm not suggesting that you should or shouldn't, uh, <clears throat> but you're going to have to get your stuff together and be there in three days. Yeah, uh, if you want to go, and you know that was sort of like." You know, what if that didn't happen? Uh, <laughs> well, that was one of those pivotal moments. I mean, I was, you know, I had been a legal assistant at a big law firm in New York City, and that kind of ended. And I'd applied to law school. I got rejected everywhere. I was on the waiting list at these two schools. And in the meantime, I was a production assistant on this low-budget independent right. movie, which I was About really, abortion. Right. It was, called, it was called Rain Without Thunder. <laughs> Nobody saw it. But I actually... That was like the greatest job ever. My job was to drive the talent around. So I got to pick up Jeff Daniels from the hotel oh, I didn't know that. and drive him to set. And I got to ask him all these questions about working with, you know, this director and that director and the theater company that he had in Michigan. Um, who else? Like Steve Zahn was in that movie. Linda Hunt, remember from The Killing Fields? No, the really but- short woman. Um, she won an Oscar for that. I got to drive her. I mean, it was, you know, I was getting coffee. It was a, you know, like right. low on the wrong job, but it was really fun. But I was not in a good way. And yeah, I, I didn't even have an apartment anymore. I was like couch surfing at friends. So you didn't even right. know how to get a hold of me. Right. But I had to be there right away. And I literally, you know, when I, f- when somehow you got in touch with a friend of mine who, my friend Chris Hildenbrand. Was, the guy was Ty me, Brown. Yeah. And then I had to get, you know, from I had to like pack my bag and go down to DC and get a car and figure out where Ithaca was and right. drive in there. And like literally, I was in a law a law school class like the next day. I didn't even have an apartment. I didn't know that I was going to. I at that point, I had written off that that was even going to be the path for me. Pablo was there though. Already. Um, yeah. not at that time because right. he had started there and then he had stopped out to train for the '92 oh. Olympics in Barcelona. He then finished when I finished. So we, oh, okay. we did our final okay. year together. Um, but I think about that too, like what would have happened had right. that not happened. But I don't think me freewheeling it in New York City would have ended well. 
I think in certain respects, like getting me out of Manhattan and into Ithaca in a structured environment was probably a good thing. And I, you know, I actually enjoyed law school. Um, ultimately, really? you know, being, a, being a lawyer in a law firm was not the path for me, but the academic aspect of being in law school, I actually, you know, I have fond memories. I've never of heard that. you say that. You have it? But I didn't like law school, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that could have been, I mean, you know, life could have been very, very different had that not happened. But, you know, here we are. I know. You know, know. and, and I think, you know, I think it's also even in, even in sobriety for me, um, it's been, it's been a challenge for you to see me make choices that are kind of a little bit, you know, far afield from what, perhaps you imagine. It's not Georgetown, D.C. Yeah, so it's like, I'm not, you know, I didn't move back to Washington. I'm not driving a Volvo around with stickers on the back window right. with the schools that my kids go to. Like I chose a different path. <laughs> and I think that's been, you know, a process for you and mom to, you know, acclimate to. Well, um, yeah. Showing, I, think I think we're okay now, but yeah, it, we're in it's, been, it's showing been up a, at the wedding. It's been in a my... journey. Showing up at the wedding when you got married to Julie with in my seersucker suit, right? And it, with Bhagavan Das standing seven feet right. tall and sandalwood on his forehead. And the, <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, you know, yeah. I know it's yeah. a lot. Julie was well, she was she was seven months pregnant. She was pregnant, and right. she had a henna tattoo on right, her belly. Right. right. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot for you know uh, inside the Beltway lawyer. Right. 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 No, it was, it was, uh, but you know, this, it, yeah, it, we, today, I mean, still your lifestyle is so much different than, than ours. Um, but we were talking last night, we just, you know, loved it. We think it's so great and we love the kids. Um, Julie is, is an amazing, an ama you know, she continues to astound me with the stuff that she does and she comes up with, um, and uh, last night, Nancy said the nicest things to uh, Jaya after after Mathis had left. She she just Nancy is is just uh, enamored uh, with with Jaya child. and what a yeah. free spirit she is. Um, so she's a cool kid. Um, yeah, you come know, a we've, long way. We've you know we've made some you know choices about how to live that are you know right. a little bit different, and you know that comes with you know. It, it, we, we're not always making the right decisions about that, but you know, I feel like we're we're trying to you know live in an authentic way and right. and do it you know as responsible. Nancy parents. always says, "How does he make any money?" <laughs> I <know. laughs> and I constantly explain it as best I can, yeah. but it is somewhat of a mystery. <laughs> well, there's no you know there's no edifice or boss you know from which the paycheck comes, and it's a different you know it's. Look, it's I. I understand. You don't get a W two. Uh, no. Well, well, maybe you do. I don't know. No, I don't get yeah. a W two. Um, well, we can. Ex <laughs> I can explain all of that to you later. <laughs> but she did say it was funny. She's like, "Do you pay the guests to come on the show on the podcast?" <laughs> I'm so hoping to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I'll yeah. send you the check later. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, and I try. I try to be you know, empathetic and sympathetic to right. that because it is so different. But yeah. I think we're we're in a good place now, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like we, yeah. you and I have grown a lot closer over the last, you know, two years or something right. like that. And that that's warms my heart. And I would like to, you know, continue that evolution. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reserved about stuff like that, but yeah. um, I... I what do you mean I, reserved? I, well, I I have more trouble talking about our relationship yeah. and you know how much I love you and things like that. Uh, so it's just it's just we don't have to do it in a public the way, forum. It's the way yeah. it's the way I am. Well, let's talk uh, about yeah. let's talk about George Marshall. Oh my God! <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Are you ever going to get to it? <laughs> yeah, the book. <laughs> this is why I'm here. I know. No. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know it's your third book. Right. Um, and, you know, tackling something like this, 
you know, is such a huge commitment of time and resources and energy. Like, how do you settle on your subject matter? Like, why did you decide, like, George Marshall is the person I want to spend the next five years with? Yeah, it's a, it's sort of, it's a progression because of the, the, all three books actually have a common person that runs through them. And, and it's the founder of my law firm, uh, Stepdown Johnson. Right. So the first book was about Louis Johnson, who was Secretary of Defense under Truman, fired by uh, Truman, uh, famously, uh, and replaced uh, by George Marshall. So, yeah. There's a through line. Yeah, that, that through line. And then um, Harry Hopkins, the second book, was, you know, Roosevelt's, uh, one of Roosevelt's closest advisors and lived in the White House for three and a half years and was a, you know, a former social worker. But he and he and Marshall, of all people, became really close close friends. And that uh, Marshall used Hopkins to get to Roosevelt, or he was a, a you know a form of communication to the White House because George Marshall did not want to get real close um, on a social or, or intimate relationship with Franklin Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. It was it was a moral code that he had. Um, so. I, you know, I almost abandoned the Marshall Project because my first uh, agent and publisher, um, you know, did not like my original proposal. Actually, it was a, a much shorter treatment of Marshall, but they, you know, they didn't, I don't think my agent really got it. And she didn't really know, um, you know, sort of that era, that time, that time frame. So I switched agents and, you know... Um, they encouraged me to make it a big book, and they encouraged me. You know, I said, "You've got, you know, you've got talent uh, as a writer, um, and you know, you can do this." So they, that's why it got to be as big as you know, as long right. a book as it's possible. Well, also, but, there was like this treasure trove of documents that were yeah. recently discovered, right? Yeah, a lot of stuff. Well, the question, you know, there's been biographies about Marshall. There's a four volume, you know, two thousand page biography that was sort of the, you know, the the, the standard thing back in the 80s uh, by a guy named Forrest Pogue. Uh, so everything, you know, you, know, you have to start with that. But all the, you know, all the letters, the, the family letters and so on were donated to the uh, Marshall Foundation, uh, uh, you know, uh, three or four years ago. And then we happened to meet with uh, George Marshall's would be his step his step grandson. Um, Marshall had no children, and he had this favorite uh, stepson named Alan Brown, who was killed in the war, uh, in World War II. That's a whole that's, right. and that's a big story, part of my book. But his his the the guy that was killed, his son lives up in northern Massachusetts, uh, and he. You know, we went up, Nancy and I went up to visit with he and his wife in this little farmhouse. Uh, it's up on the border between uh, Vermont and Massachusetts on the Connecticut River. And he pulls out this box of documents underneath a, uh, you know, a bench in his, in his den, you know, started pulling things out. And, you know, and that just went nuts, you know, yeah. uh, letters that had, you know, in these thin envelopes that, that were written during the war, the, the so-called V letters. Uh, back and forth. Um, so he loaned that, uh, that whole box to me. So I, you know, took them home and I actually started getting nervous that I'd lose them or something like that. So I, I made records of all of them and gave them back. But for example, you know, the, the, the battle, uh, the battle map that was in, uh, this guy's father's hand when he was leading a tank on the way to Rome. Uh, shot in the head with a sniper, but the battle map itself just gave me a chills because I had a piece of a piece of Marshall's history. history. Yeah. Uh, so the thing about Marshall, though, is character. And yeah. if I if you have to say anything about the book, it's just you, know, you say what is about what is it about? You know what is it? It's it's character. Yeah, uh, so. I mean, look, we're talking about a guy who's, you know, uh, arguably the most distinguished military leader <laughs> since George Washington, right? right? And, right. you know, a guy who, who you know, five-star general who had a career that spanned 50 years under 10 presidents and right. all these in different incarnations from great military leader to 
you know, being Secretary of Defense and you know, Secretary, all the of way State. Secretary of State and, you know, winning the Nobel Prize and, you know, being a leader in World War I and World War II and then ultimately all the way through the Cold War. I mean, right. this guy's legacy is just, you know, it's insane, but he's always kind of been perceived as this austere, you know, stoic. Aloof. Nobody could really mm. kind of get a handle on his, his personality right. or his character. And that's kind of what you've been able to crack here with this. Well, I hope so. Um, but it's not easy with him. He is a very, a very difficult character to get a handle on. But with the, with the letters from his, you know, to and from him, his favorite, the, the son he never had, the stepson. Right. Um, he so his married first, his first wife. Couldn't have kids, right? She had a heart condition, right, and died. And then he then he marries this actress later, <laughs> yeah, and you know gets this stepson Alan, who was kind of the son he never had, right, and ends up sort of pulling some strings to make sure that he got into this tank yeah. tank battalion that ultimately lends, leads to his demise, right. So there's that ironic thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Marshall pulled strings. He never would do a favor for anybody, but he did for this kid, headstrong uh, uh, stepson that he really loved. Uh, got him into uh, the 1st Armored Division, which had just finished with Kasserine Pass and was going into Italy. Um, and, and of course, Marshall, from a strategic point of view, would never wanted to be in Italy anyway. He had this fight with Churchill over that. Uh, so, but anyway, steps on the pull strings for, gets into Italy, and then gets killed. And actually, his wife, Catherine, the the mother of Alan, knew that she found out that Marshall had pulled strings to get him into uh, uh, this uh, armored tank unit, and she was mad. She, well, uh, yeah, you know, uh, she. I was, mean, that could be considered uh, an unforgivable. And he wrote, he wrote Alan, uh, he said, keep this confidential, but your mother is really angry uh, about how I got you into this stuff. But, you know, um, and, you know, when, when he was killed, it was, you know, obviously a devastating thing for, for his mother and everybody else. But uh, so that story is that sort of a backstory that goes into talking about Marshall and all of his accomplishments, setbacks, you know, mistakes. Um, but, you know, probably his greatest moment and the moment he'll be remembered for um, was a speech at Harvard in uh, 1947 where he uh, he was not a great speaker, but he gave the, the speech that introduced the Marshall Plan, which what became known as the Marshall Plan. He never called it the Marshall Plan, but it was called the Marshall Plan, and it, it was the economic uh, plan that the United States financed that saved Western Europe. Um, right. Rebuild, and, rebuilding and, Europe. It right. was originally the, called the Truman Plan, right? But Truman's popularity right. was in yeah. the gutter at the time. Well, Truman said, uh, you know, I don't call it that. Anything, it's, anything that they send up with my name on it is going to, what do you say? Anything that they send up to the hill with my name on it is going to uh, quiver a couple of times, uh, uh, fall onto its belly and die. He said, right. even the worst congressman, even the worst Republican will vote for something if it has Marshall's name on it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, his name, he's called, you know, he's called the man with a plan, uh, but he did so much more. Uh, so I, I have this great reverence for, for uh, the way he conducted himself and the strong character he had, because he could have been, he could have been president. He could have been anything. Right. Uh, he turned down the job of, of you know, leading. Well, Eisenhower became president because of Marshall. Uh, Marshall could have had the job of leading the Normandy invasion, which incident, incidentally is the 75th anniversary in June. Um, but Marshall could have had that had he asked for it, and he wouldn't ask for it. Uh, so The president wanted him in Washington at the yeah, time. Right. And he was able to kind of, you know, uh, set aside his own personal ambitions um, and his ego for, you know, what was required to do the right. job, which goes to that, you know, issue of character. I mean, do you think, you know, time and time again, this is a guy who's like so disciplined in how he compartmentalizes his personality in order to kind of do the job. And he's continually, you know, 
you know, f- from from like building, you know, the military complex as we know it today from scratch and, right. you know, reinvigorating the officer corps, like all of these things, like the legacy of the work that he did back then we're still living with. But do you think like had he like what what is the price that he paid for, you know, ascribing to this, you know, ego is the enemy kind of, you know, stoic mindset? I mean, could he have been president? Like what, what, you know, what would his, his path have been had he allowed himself to- probably, He probably wouldn't have been center. a great president because he was so, he, he had this moral code that was, he was very, inf, he was much more inflexible, I suppose, with respect to politicians. He had a, you know- uh, I, I, He just a, wouldn't play the game. A form of contempt. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, toward uh, the political side of things. And he, he had a terrible temper, which he managed to control most of the time, but sometimes it, it let loose. The, um, the people that have blurbed the book, and there are about 10 of them, I think now, you know, some famous authors and, uh, you know, the generals and so on. The, what, you know, what they're, some, some of them are saying it, some of it's just implicit, is that, you know, in this, they say things like in this era of failed leadership today, you know, this, yeah. this man, George Marshall, you know, stands out or wish we had a Marshall today, uh, that kind of stuff. So there's a political, you know, I think the reviews and so forth of the book are going to probably be looking at that. And yeah, the make, timeliness of it, because the juxtaposition of right. his moral character, you right. know, in contrast to right. what we're seeing, you know, currently, you the know, amoral, like kind right. of, you know, hoist <clears throat> him up as this example, right. you know, <clears throat> that or or this this kind of archetype that we need to reconnect with, and probably the person today that most resembles Marshall in terms of his behavior and character is 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 as general mattis who of course resigned uh because uh the president i forget exactly what the president didn't do that he wanted her to do but there well, were serious, she, she, serious she, 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 so many things have happened since <laughs> yeah. then it's yeah. impossible so Matt, mattis was kind of a monk like character he he wasn't even married uh or isn't never married uh but is kind of regarded as the same sort of person who you know um uh, is above it all. But do you think that a person of, of you know, Marshall's kind of uh, ethical stature could even survive, you know, Capitol Hill right now? Probably I mean, not. without, with, you know, somebody who's going to say, I stand on this ground and I'm not going to play, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to submit to the histrionics of right. daily politics isn't right. going to last a week. It's not to say he wasn't. I mean, in order to get the Marshall Plan passed through Congress, it was a titanic job. As you're talking about post-war America, we're trying to get our economy back on, a, on their feet. And they want to spend, at that time, $13 billion on saving a bunch of countries in Western Europe. So the selling of that Marshall Plan was a hugely political exercise. And Marshall, was, it, because he was regarded as nonpartisan, had a huge role in, in basically lobbying the congressman. So it, it wasn't like he... You know, was one of the reasons why Mar- uh, Roosevelt wanted him in Washington was because he was good with Congress. Mm. So I'm just saying, you know, the political situation, the, the, his political expertise, it was it was a different kind. Now, if he, if if he were Secretary of Defense or Secretary of State under under Trump, I can't imagine it would last. You know, for right. more than six months. Right. Uh, you know, he might have let a few things go by. Uh, but if he's getting continually undermined or contradicted or belittled, uh, you know, either that or somehow he would have captured Trump uh, as he did Truman. Truman just, you know, you know, uh, revered Marshall. I mean, anything, you know, anything Marshall wanted, but Trump would never do that uh, in my judgment. So. I mean, what are the yeah. what are the kind of lessons that we can draw from this guy's example that are relevant to you know helping us kind of understand well, finding our way forward in this climate? Uh, I don't, you know, character matters. Um, you know, uh, you know, we we uh, 
<laughs> you know, it, it just and magnanimity. I mean, you know, uh, David Brooks uh, wrote a great little book uh, about character. And I, I just heard him on a podcast the other day. He's had quite uh, a, a revelation in his personal life. I know, I know. Uh, and the recent book, and people are wondering whether he's Christian or Jewish and all that stuff. And That's kind of beside the point. I, I know, well, but they are. And so, in any event, um, uh, you know, character matters. Is Are we ever going to get back to the to the point where we have these kinds of people in our government? Um, you know, the last we've been hearing a lot about uh, the Bush family recently because of uh, Susan Page's book about Barbara Bush. And she, Susan Page is a good friend of ours. And, you know, the last kind of president that that bore any resemblance and, and had a cabinet that bore any resemblance to uh, uh, the way it was with Marshall is George H.W. Bush, probably. Mm. Uh, so. Um, and are we ever going to, you know, are we ever going to get back to the era where we have moral people that will take stands on principle? Uh, well, there's a, there seems to be a split, yeah. and I'm interested, you know, in your perspective on this as somebody who's lived in Washington for a very long time and is steeped in, you know, politics as, you know, a Beltway insider. There's the perspective that what's happening now is is an anomaly. That's and we what just we have hope. to we have to weather it out, and you know that ballast will find you know its neutral point. You know that it will swing back towards some semblance of normalcy. Right. And the other camp, which is things are never going to be the same. You know, know, we've created a different system, and we've accepted certain things and created precedents for which you know it's unclear. I'm afraid you know, what the future yeah, holds. Yeah, yeah, I'm concerned about that. And and what? So what do like your colleagues, you know, on on Capitol Hill? Like, what is the you know kind of inside banter on all of that? I you know I think that the communications uh, that we have now in you know, getting the information out uh, and how quickly it gets out, um, you know, by tweet and you know and all the all the social media. Has changed it probably forever, you know, and we're react. We have to react much quicker to everything. Uh, there's and and so, I, you know, I I do think that we're never going to get back to sort of the old uh, days of uh, George H. W. Bush and that kind of you know. Uh, it's a little. It's elitist. It's a yeah. you know, uh, you know the Brent Scroke Scowcrofts and. And and those kinds of people, and you know, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld, uh, I think, you know, in terms of the cabinet that eight, that the George George W had, um, you know, took us part of that way um, in terms of you know uh, not having not having the I don't know the the standing the strength of character that uh, somebody like uh, Marshall or the predecessors. Um, have had so I, I think I think there there's probably a permanent shift that isn't good and we're not going to come back to it. Um, yeah. So um, I'm not uh, the identity politics. The idea that we now have you know twenty probably more than twenty. I think the De Blasio is going about is, is about to move into the Democratic uh, candidacy. Everybody's running for president all at once. It's unbelievable. I know. One term senators. Uh, I heard a joke the other day. Somebody said like they could just throw in a name with a stock photo of somebody to see if they could just <laughs> if it would just fly under the radar. Until somebody said, "Wait, who's that guy? <laughs> it's the guy from the Abercrombie and Fitch catalog." Yeah, and, and I haven't even heard about Howard Schultz lately. But you know, so, I haven't heard anything about him lately. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, everybody thinks, well, if Trump can can pull it off. Uh, you know, somebody else. You know. So, you know, and I'm worried about um, <clears throat> what will happen uh, when Trump loses, which, you know, a good chance he will next time around, you know, the transition. Uh, and, you know, when he's out of power, he'll be, he'll be in it. He'll be 
causing just about as much trouble as he is now. Yeah, it's uh, not. He's not going to go quietly no. into the night, no matter no. what happens. No, it, it'll and, be. And a what is that going to look like? Terrible transition. Um, and yeah, it's. So I don't want to be, you know, <laughs> overly, you know, sounding like an old grouch <laughs> about about you know how, <laughs> how things are going these days and so forth. And the good old uh, days. Uh, you know, there are some right. great candidates among the Democrats. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, who I would choose at this point. Um, it's early but, days. So, you when know, you, but when you when you look at, you know, back to Marshall, like yeah. when you look at um, his character and his, <clears throat> you know, incredible um, capacity for leadership, like what are what are some of those leadership skills that we can extract from his example that you'd like to see more of. Like if, if somebody's listening to this and they're running a small company or they're a coach or a teacher, like what are these, you know, I'm, I'm interested in kind of like how you distill down right. what it was about him that made him so effective. Well, I think the, the you know, his, his choice of people to be put in various jobs, um, you know, he didn't like self promoters. He he didn't. You know, he 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 was selfless himself uh, to a to an enormous degree. And and you know, so he chose people that weren't self promoters. He chose people that uh, that uh, well that 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 replicated his own his own uh, abilities. Um, in terms of leading leading people, a lot of it has to do with. Uh, I think Dean Acheson used to try to describe it. Uh, Dean Acheson worked with with Marshall a lot. Dean Acheson was Secretary of Defense or Secretary of State after uh, Marshall. Um, he had a sense when he entered the room. There was a everybody in it knew that he was entering the room. Right. He had it was a sense of controlled power. Now, what was that? It was, you know, he it, he didn't. He he ran meetings where he basically let everybody talk before he he uh, he would then render an opinion. He had this amazing gravitas, you know, and people didn't mess around with him. Um, how did he do that? Uh, the best the best words that I could remember from uh, were Atchison's words: controlled power. He was under control. Uh, everything was uh, business like, rapid fire. It was all serious stuff, no joking around, no you know bullshit um and or if there was bullshit, he would call it out, but he always he let everybody else talk hmm. you know until they were done, and then he would say, "Okay, this is what we're gonna do right um he was not you know uh he was not a good speaker, public speaker, notorious red red speeches. Uh, he was more effective uh, in in small groups. Um, I think I think he. Everybody knew he lived by a moral code that was above most others, and they did not want to. You know, they did not want to displease him in any mm-hmm. way. Um, you know, he said. You know, he used to say to the guys that worked for him, women. T- Actually, he was fairly. Uh, <clears throat> important promoter of women later in the in uh when he was secretary of state um but he would he would say uh you know don't don't you know don't worry the problem don't worry you know uh, i i don't want to hear about how you you know the trouble you're having with my with my just assignment solve the fucking you know, problem just do it yeah yeah, yeah. um you know i i don't want to hear about that stuff i hit you know when he when he when he uh when he was trying to figure out how to design, design the Marshall Plan, he didn't design it. <clears throat> uh, he found the guy, the brightest guy, you know, in the uh, State Department, George Kennan, uh, <clears throat> and he pulled Kennan out from the War College or wherever he was, and said, and brought him into Washington. This right after he became Secretary of State, he set up a policy planning thing. Anyway. He explained his vision of a Marshall Plan to help Western Europe, and he said to Kennan, uh, "You got three weeks to come up with a plan." And Kennan said, "Well, you know, what do you want? You know, do you have any <laughs> guidance or whatever?" Yeah. He said, 
Yeah, avoid trivia. Uh, now, he may have said a few more things than that, but Kennan, Kennan already knew that, in fact, Kennan, what Kennan wrote back in 1946 about Russia is so, so uh, far, it, it's such an, a perfect analysis of the way the Russian uh, you know, people and their governments uh, are and have been ever since. So they're, they're doing the same thing today that Kennan talked about back in 1946. And in what so, respect? Marshall found, well, that, <clears throat> that uh, they were paranoid. There was a paranoid, not just, you know, not just Stalin, Stalin at the time, but now we're dealing with Putin and all the people since uh, bef- between them. Borders. It's all about border security. Uh, and when NATO is expanding now from, it used to be 12 countries to 29, surrounding, uh, surrounding the Soviet Union, well, now today Russia, uh, you know, right on their borders, you know, it drives them crazy. And, and you can make an argument that we should never have expanded NATO the way we have uh, because it just exacerbates the problems that we have with Russia. But also uh, their desire to destabilize uh, this is back in 1946. He was talking about that. Now today we're using, you know, cyber uh, uh, <clears throat> cyber methods to to stabilize the United States. But Cannon was predicting it back then. Uh, <clears throat> but Cannon was such an intellectual; it was always hard to ever pin him down because the, you know, the minute you started talking, well, it's all about you know, we got to have more missiles or what? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about containing them through through economics. Uh, so I'm just saying, Marshall picked Kennan, uh, <clears throat> put him in. The first thing he did when he came to the State Department, he said, "Nobody around here is thinking about uh, you know problems that we may face in the future. We need." Who, mm-hmm. He got Kennan. He brought Kennan back from Russia, or from uh, wherever he was. I think it was at Russia at the time, uh, <clears throat> and set up a policy planning thing. And Kennan basically ran the State Department. You know, foreign policy under Marshall. Um, so, but he crafted the essence of what became the Marshall Plan. Yeah, and I think well, there were three different people actually. Uh, it was Marshall's thoughts. Uh, a guy named uh, 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 Chip Bolin actually wrote the first draft of the speech. He was a young interpreter, but a very smart guy. And then Cannon, Cannon was the right. big brain. But <clears throat> what I hear in that is. In Marshall, this guy who <clears throat> would, you know, approach these problems by finding the smartest people who knew more than him, and he wasn't yeah. afraid to push them out front and to sublimate his own personal aspirations or egoic tendencies in order to get the job yeah, done. You say that better than and, I do. That's and, right. Yeah, and the lesson in that is, <clears throat> you know, ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, like this guy's one of the greatest statesmen of all time, and we all know who he is. And yet that was forged through, you know, a persistent um, uh, refusal to, you know, make these decisions based on his own personal advancement. Like the irony oh, sure. in that, you know right. what I mean? And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be um, appreciated about that. Um, you know, that, that, that level of selfless humility. I mean, this is what Ryan talks about in this book. You know, it's ego is the enemy. Like right. if, when you're, when you're being driven by your ego versus sublimating the right. ego for, uh, y- y- you know, sublimating the ego in order to be of maximum service to getting the job done properly without forethought for who's getting credit for it ultimately results in the advancement that you're, Probably seeking anyway. That's right, and it happened to to Marshall in two you know uh, iconic moments. One when he grabbed General Pershing in First World War, grabbed him by the arm because uh, <clears throat> Pershing had come and and, and it had criticized uh, the training of the First Division when they were. This is when they were still trying to get ready to go into into the First World War. They were over in France training. Pershing came and ripped everybody apart. And Marshall was at that time a major, uh, in not a general. He was, you know, and grabbed Pershing's arm literally. It was like, you know, grab the, you know, the, you know, the head of the army, <clears throat> the whole, that the whole the 
American expeditionary force was purging, grabbed his arm and said, you don't understand what's going on here. You're, we're getting bullshit orders. He didn't say that, but he said, we're getting these orders from your people in back where they are, and they don't make any sense. And he went, blah, 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 and it went on. And uh, he, yeah, everybody said, you're done, you know, um, mm. and... and uh, Pershing came back, you know, a few days later and said, let's sit down and talk about this. I think right. you hit, you know, same thing happened with, uh, with, you know, 22 years later, he's in a meeting uh, where he want he wants to be appointed by Roosevelt dep- uh, ch- chief of staff. He's up for being chief of staff, but he's sitting in this meeting in the back of the white, you know, cabinet room in the white house. And <clears throat> Roosevelt's, you know, talking away and, you know, doing his usual and and coming up with a plan, this is in 1938, you know, uh, how many planes they should build or whatever. And he, he says, what, don't you think so, George? Uh, trying to get everybody else in the room had agreed. On, on board with his. Everybody else in the room had agreed and said, oh, yeah, that's right, Mr. President. I don't know. Yeah. And Marshall said, first of all, he's irritated that, he, that the president called him by his first name. But Marshall <laughs> didn't like that. <laughs> If you didn't know him, if uh-huh. you knew him, it was okay. Patton called him by first name, uh, but so uh, <clears throat> he said, "I, you know, I don't agree with that at all, Mister President." Mm. And and Roosevelt was was shot. He was startled, you know. And the meeting ended, and so all of uh, Marshall's friends said. <laughs> you, you, right, it's like a, you a, just ruined your chance to be. But there's multiple examples of this where he speaks yeah. truth to power in a very blunt and frank way, in a in a career-ending way, right. and yet ultimately um, he keeps sort of right. not just surviving that, but advancing himself as a now, result. If, you know, if he if if you know he did that to Trump, you know, Trump would yeah. never confront him personally, but it, you know, it might be the end of him with Trump. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what so, was what was the the most surprising thing that you learned about him and all of this research that you've done over the years? Um, well, I so I suppose that you know the inner life part of it. Uh, it was you know there. He's know, actually he, a human he, being. He, yeah, and and around his he had a few intimate friends, you know, and I relate to that. Um, you know, not, he wasn't, you know, he didn't like to go out in Washington and, you know, socialize and all that stuff. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he had this intense love. I, you know, I, one of the things I didn't even put in the book was <clears throat> they sent Alan, the, the favorite stepson, to a prep school in Virginia called Woodbury Forest. And on one of my trips down to, uh, Lexington, I decided I'm going to go to Woodbury Forest, the prep school, and see what they have in terms of letters from Marshall or Marshall's wife to this kid while he was in prep school. And uh-huh. the kid was always getting in trouble. He was, yeah. I knew he was, you know, and but he was a great athlete. And that's what Marshall loved, you know, uh, to go fishing with him and, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, monitor his progress at Woodbury Forest. So, I couldn't believe it. The prep school let me look at everything there, there was there. Mm. Uh, and I didn't find anything, you know, I found out about how he stole a car one night and, you know, escaped and almost got kicked out of school. And then the letters that go back and forth uh, and how he, uh, I don't know, where, d- the various exploits. Uh, but, and how Marshall and his wife re- reacted to that. So, you know, here, they're just parents, you know, they're just... Yeah. Uh, like everybody else. He has to uh, put his pants on one leg at a time, uh, just like everyone else. Uh, yeah, he, and he, <coughs> and they they had this relationship with a young girl, uh, Rose, who they met when, uh, when he and his first wife moved into Washington, they moved in this apartment building, and Rose was only eight. And she was precocious, and she started, she saw Marshall in his uniform and started talking to him in the elevator, and and he just, you know, he he established a relationship that went for the rest of his life with her. Um, wow. She had, she was his goddaughter. She, had, you know, all this stuff. Um, and she wrote a, actually wrote a book about it. So, so you can find out and, uh, you know, how he confessed to her when he lost his first wife, you know. So there was a, a, 
a whole human side. Right, that, like this more yeah. robust interior life than yeah, yeah, you right, would have imagined. Right, right. So, and this book is really kind of the first place like that, where, yeah, yeah. That, where you're, you're um, able to weave that. I, th- I think so, yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't, you don't want to get, you know, there's so much in terms of his accomplishments that you want to also, so you got to figure out the balance. Balancing of, that. Of, uh, you know, what he's doing in the Marshall Plan versus, you know, and then there was a year in China, which, you know, it defies, you know, description where he's supposed to negotiate a coalition government between the communists and the nationalists. Right, like between uh, Chiang Kai-shek and yeah, Mao Zedong, yeah, so, right? So, you know, it's uh, so, uh, and how hard he tried and how That ultimately was a failure, right? Terrible yeah. failure. Yeah. Terrible failure, buddy, you know, and he spent too much time trying to do it. Um, but again, and that was where he wouldn't take no for an answer. Everybody said, you're never going to be able to do this. And of course, they were right, but... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So he made he made some uh, he made a big mistake in terms of civil military relations. He almost crossed the line uh, with Roosevelt, um, uh, and you know he had all his reasons. But he he engaged in a sort of resistance to civilian authority uh, for maybe three or four weeks when uh-huh. he you know um, you know. Because he stands, he, you know, he stands as an example of the, dip, you know, he observes that the distinction between civilian authority and military authority, but he violated that, um, right, that code. But he came what, back from it. <clears throat> what do you think? I mean, Truman sort of famously sounded this warning bell about uh, the the impending problematic nature of the growing military industrial complex. Well, that was really right. Eisenhower, was it, but uh, oh, right, it was Eisenhower. Yeah, it it I'm was sorry. really Eisenhower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so, was Eyesenhower. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was that was that, that was his but, famous speech. Right, yeah, yeah that famous speech. Yeah, right. What do you think Marshall would think of what that has become today? Well, I think he'd probably have some of the same reactions that Eisenhower had. Um, but the one thing that he that that he began promoting. And it's why Stanley McChrystal likes uh, this book is, uh, so much uh, about Marshall. He believed that as a result of what happened in the Depression, in the Depression, um, one of Roosevelt's brainchilds was creating the civil, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, where they took all these young, uh, at that point it was all men, young men, 18 years old, who were, whose parents, you know, didn't have job, 25% unemployment. So he took all these young men and moved them into camps around the country and the army ran it. It's like a new deal thing? Oh yeah, this is a new deal, 1932. Actually, by the summer of 1933, this plan was put together and they were moving them all over the country, putting them in tents and they were chopping trees down and they were planting bushes and parks and they were building dams, and they were doing all kinds of stuff. Well, Marshall was involved in that during the Depression. He, uh, he, first of all, he ran the Southeast Division, and then he did. But he loved the idea of how these men from all walks of life uh, would come together, and you know, it was a unifying thing, and it was also about being a citizen. So he took that concept from the Depression, and he started promoting it. Uh, and he actually got a lot of traction uh, right after the Second World War uh, w- with a bill, Universal Military Service, uh-huh. you know, uh, a- as a way to avoid a large standing army. <clears throat> and, of course, you know, we have the voluntary army today. But in other words, instead of having to draft these people from scratch, if you ever get into a conflict, you'd have a everybody, it would be like Israel. Uh, you right. would have two or three years they're kind of, of mandatory. Ready, they're service. ready to go. Now that doesn't, you know, in today's world, it might be more national service, and that's what Stanley McChrystal is promoting today. Not getting anywhere with it uh, very far, but the idea of having citizens, you know, that learn about citizenship uh, by helping, by doing something, helping mm-hmm. something, getting paid by the government, uh, maybe, um, which is would be hugely expensive. But he always, he always loved the idea of national service. Um, and he had great, uh, great respect for how 
you know, if you get everybody together in some project, um, you know, when they're young, they come out of it and we have a, a more informed citizenship. Uh, and an esprit de corps and a, and yeah. a sense of community and purpose. And, right. you know, there's a lot that comes out of that. <clears throat> I mean, so, you know, and the guy from Brooklyn and, and the, you know, the, in, the Native American from Arizona mm-hmm. and, you know, the, you know the, all that sort of thing melding together with a citizenship. It may be, you know, <clears throat> too altruistic and too, but, but it was something that was ingrained in him. Um, and it was, but that's quite that's quite a you know quite far afield from you know the current reality in which we have this intersection between you know the the defense contractors and you know the K Street lobbyists oh, yeah. and <clears throat> the legislators that are you know really for lack of a better word this cabal that you know creates policy at the highest level that drives our foreign policy. All right. <clears throat> and that was what, you know, kind of the crux of my question, like, like, what would Marshall think of that? Like, that's very different from the esprit de corps of some kind of national service, right. where, you know, the amount of money um, and influence that gets peddled into decisions around how we're ramping up our, our military and our spending and how that trickles down into decisions that we make overseas is, you know, it's, it's disturbing, and, and uh, yeah, it, it of course it has it, it, it. It's driven by you know having projects in the congressman's local districts, right? And it's a jobs program, you know, right. rather than what do we really need for national defense? Right. And trying to shut down any of these programs is impossible, right? Um, and that's troubling. Uh, uh, yes, it is, and yeah. I'm sure it would trouble Marshall. <laughs> There's no question about it. You know, he. Uh, he was so far removed from, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, he used to do bu- budgets and all kinds of things like that. But, you know, he never had a, he never went out and, you know, had to have sort of a regular, a, a regular job. Uh-huh. His wife, you know, bought uh, the, uh, his wife had money. A second it. wife or the first second wife? Yeah. yeah. She, she came from a family of, of, uh, you know, Baker back in the civil war, they, they made money, um, uh, in the South, but she financed, she bought the houses, right. you know, she bought a house. Well, there's that, and, that and famous house, the Dodona house in right. you know, Leesburg. She, that was her, you know, uh, she bought that. And I don't, you know, Marshall was offered tons of money to write his memoir. This is another thing about him. You know, everybody writes a book today. Right. Um, but he, uh, he had all kinds of people after him all the time to write a book. Um, memoir. He could have made, you know, untold amounts of money. And most of these generals are doing it. Right. It'll be interesting to see whether- But he ma- had a rich wife and he was living in a really nice house. Yeah. So- He didn't need the money. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think they uh, they ever lacked the other, uh, although they, they had a, my, you know, a mod. she bought the house in Leesburg and then they bought this one story house part of the way down south in North Carolina uh, where- where he spent a lot of the later years, um, but you know, they, they, you know, he, he was getting a salary from the army until he, 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 he you know, until he died. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so, but he famously did not. He said, "I, if I, you know, if I wrote my memoirs, I'd have to, you know, talk about some people that I'd rather not talk <laughs> about or some issues. I won't. Uh-huh. I won't. I don't want to disparage anybody." Yeah. It he was had a wonderful, un- unbefitting of a man of that, you yeah. know, kind of uh, moral latitude. Right. But you know, he he was he was friends with George Patton, and Patton really, you know, went after Marshall to be close to him. Uh, and and uh, but you know, he understood Patton. Um, you know, Patton. You know, understood Patton needed to be. Uh, he was the combat general that you know that everybody had to have. Mm-hmm. So when. Eisenhower was was <clears throat> trying to decide whether to get rid of Patton because of the slapping incidents um, that got in all the newspapers. Um, Marshall said, "No, we got to use him. We'll use him. We'll use him after we after we get into Normandy. As soon as we get into Normandy, we're going to put him back in." Mm. So they used him as a decoy uh, before Normandy. Um, so he understood people like that, but 
he, yeah, he didn't, you know, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't respect Patton for uh, his, uh, well, his, his peccadillos. Yeah, well, yeah, and his uh, self promotion. Mm. Uh, so, which was highly effective. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> Patton, yeah, Patton uh, once had an opportunity when Marshall needed a place to live. You know, Patton took him into one of his apartments or one of his houses and he wrote his wife, he said, boy, if I pulled off a big one, I'm going to get a lot of, you know, I'm now close to Marshall. And, you know, uh-huh. and he said, and then he says to his wife, but I'm not getting out much anymore. You know, uh-huh. it's just like. <laughs> you won't let him out to do his thing. Um, so anyway, it's, yeah. Well, good. Um, let's wrap this up. Yeah. I'm going for two hours. Um It is an amazing accomplishment. I'm super proud of you. you. It's going to take me a while, like I said, to to work my way through it. But I am looking forward to it. And, Don't uh, worry about it. <laughs> no, I'm 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 gonna. I'm more enthusiastic now about reading it, uh-huh. and um, I'm I'm just delighted that you accomplished this. I mean, it's no small thing, and I'm super excited uh, for everybody to um, have an, have a chance to read it. So it comes out July 9th. July 9th, yeah. Um, yeah, and we're we're hoping to have an event uh, up in the uh, at the chief of staff's house in late June. I'm not sure that's going to work yet, but um, where we kind of launch it, I'll have some books available by then. But I like to go and you know talk about it various places. Uh, yeah. So we'll do that. No, you'll be doing the book tour, and I'll put on my website and on the um, episode page in the show notes. Um, not only uh, links to buy the book, but any appearances that you're doing, I'm happy to uh-huh. share with everybody. Um, I love you. I love you too. Very much. much. Super proud of you. Uh-huh. And uh, this was really fun. So thank you. All right. You. And tell Ryan hi. I will. Okay. What's up, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, good. And this is the point where I say, and you can you can follow Dave on Twitter. <laughs> he has to do any happen. of that stuff. So uh, I guess you can hit me up. If you want to get to him, but um, thank you. Thank you. All right. right. Let's go see the kids. All right. All right. Peace. So what do you guys think? It was, uh, I don't know. I'm still collecting my thoughts about it. I'm really glad that I did it. Um, I am emotional about it. There's something beautiful about the fact that we got to sit together and have that conversation. And, uh, and I really am, I really, really am proud of him. So thank you, dad. I love you. And everybody pick up his book, Marshall, Defender of the Republic. Um, you can find a link on my website, go to Amazon, check out the show notes on the episode page. I normally say uh, hit up the guest and let them know what you thought of the conversation. My dad is not on social media though. So rather than that, yeah, just uh, read his book, I suppose. Um, I think it's a masterpiece. I'm excited that it's just about to be birthed into the world. And uh, I can't wait to um, watch this journey that he's about to go on. In closing, if you're struggling with your diet, Are you trying to eat better? Most of us are, right? It's tricky though. We get off the plan. It's hard to get back on. That's why we created this meal planner program. We did it to solve one very basic problem. How do you make nutritious eating convenient, delicious, and affordable? And the result is something that we're really proud of, the Plant Power Meal Planner. Uh, We've put together this digital sort of platform where you have access to thousands of delicious and easy to prepare, nutritious plant-based recipes. Everything's customized. When you sign up, you enter all this information and uh, it basically runs this algorithm so you only get the types of recipes that uh, appeal to you. Um, And it integrates with grocery lists and grocery delivery in most metropolitan areas. So everything just shows up at your doorstep. We have incredible support seven days a week from a team of really savvy, educated nutrition coaches. And you get access to all of this for just $1.90 a week when you sign up for a year. It's so affordable. Again, did I say I'm proud of this? Everybody really seems to be loving it. It's making an impact, a significant impact on people's lives. So if you want a taste of this, Again, go to meals.richroll.com, click on Meal Planner on the top menu on my website. You can learn more. You can sign up and do all that good stuff. 
If you'd like to support the work we do here on the podcast, a couple of simple ways to do that. Tell your friends about your favorite episode or just about the show in general. Share the show on social media, screen grab it or do whatever you do. Tag me. Sometimes I reshare that stuff. Subscribe. That's the most important thing on Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to this. Uh, Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or leave a comment underneath one of the videos on YouTube. That's always very helpful. And if you choose, if you are so inclined, you can support us financially on Patreon. And you can find that by just going to ritual.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much to everybody who's done that. Uh, I appreciate everybody who helped put on this show today. Jason Camiolo for all your services on audio engineering, production, show notes, interstitial music, the WordPress page, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Blake Curtis for additional audio engineering as well as videoing the show and editing it in conjunction with the talented Margot Lubin. Thank you. Jessica Miranda for graphics. DK David Kahn for advertiser relationships. Allie Rogers for her beautiful portraits that go along with each episode. And theme music is always by Analemma. Appreciate it, you guys. Like I said, uh, it's kind of heavy having my dad on, but uh, I feel good about it. Even if no one listened to this episode, I am very proud of sharing it with all of you guys. And just to have that kind of conversation with my parents, it was just, it was a great thing. So thank you for listening. I will see you back here next week uh, with a great conversation. It is with Miguel McKelvey, who is the co-founder of WeWork. Uh, It's a conversation about entrepreneurship and community. I think you guys are going to really dig it. Miguel's super cool. He's into all the kind of things that I'm into, sustainability, the environment, et cetera. So until then, uh, pick up a book. You might just learn something. Pick up my dad's book. How about that? All right, you guys. Peace. Plants. Be well. Do good. Namaste. (laughs) Namaste.